And I guess it would go off of like a net scoring system too, technically. Well, so now I would say that probably is approaching six bucks at one seventy, which is. Um, See if you can beat the machine here. Get the uh, computer. Uh, nine, no, a thousand twenty. A thousand twenty. Amazing! Yes! You beat me by a second. Yes. Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Deer Grow. Man, we've been using Deer Grow products for a long time. The Plot Start and Plot Boost, more recently Plot Till. Now we've got three new liquid fertilizers that have been put in the mix that will cover everything we could want for a food plot program. It's huge, man. The more food plotting we do, it's like, man, the, li the liquids just make sense. Like Whether it's uh, herbicides or the Plot Start and Plot Boost, or and now the fertilizers get mixed in. It's like, man, I can combine all of those in certain cases and do less passes for more results. I mean, it's all about efficiency. I mean, like you said, less passes. If you're out there treating your beans with glyphosate in the summertime, you can mix in this fertilizer, do that all at once. You have the boost in there to help some metabolism. It's all about efficiency when we're talking about food plots. And really the big difference on these liquid fertilizers is you're bypassing some of these soil limitations, pH limitations, the soil type. In a lot of cases, we talk about dry fertilizers only being available for 17% of what you put down in the first year. Mm -hmm. These liquid fertilizers straight into the plant are 90% available in the first year. Huge difference in what you're going to see in growth. It's huge. And so right now you can use code HUNTER15 for 15% off any of the Deer Grow products on their website. And as always, better food plots, bigger deer. And we're back. Hey, oh. Hunter Podcast, episode 199. Yeah, it is. Yep. One away. Yeah, One nice. Good memory. Did you check with Nick first? I did. Okay. I always checked I wasn't with listening. Nick. Nick's keeping us there. in line. I always check with yeah. Nick. Sometimes I have to like hone in and like the, yeah. The, the, yeah. yeah. So, here we go. Here we go. You want to do your part? Yeah. Hey, thank you guys for being here. Uh, whether you're listening on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, or Spotify, we appreciate you guys being here. Uh, if you've written us on, oh, I should say first, give us a like, follow, or subscribe on any of those channels. Uh, one of those will give you a notification when these podcasts drop, but we drop them every Tuesday night at 6 p.m. Eastern uh, and coming up here in the near future, potentially some Thursdays as well. So yeah. so no promises, but we'll double they're tap. coming. Yeah, check mm -hmm. them out. Um, if you've written us on Instagram uh, DM or the website, uh, we appreciate you guys reaching out. We are working through those and try to get back to them in a systematic and timely fashion, yep. uh, which means we're way behind. So. Bear with We're us. We're getting there. Uh, also, we have some new merch on the website. I'm wearing a hat that is not available yet. We're going to make you wait for that one a little bit yet. But we do have might be available by hoodies, t-shirts, long sleeves, and like some cool designs. And uh, Jeremy and I have actually been, I think, blown away at how many uh, of you have, have bought some stuff here recently. Yeah, so that's really exciting. Cool. You're supporting the podcast and doing that. And that's pretty cool. We're having fun with that. So mm -hmm. with that, here we go. Yeah. And we're going to kind of just dive into this one. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's late August, probably by the time this is coming out, I would assume. Yeah. You know. So um, we've kind of danced around this topic several times here uh, in the off season and over the summer, you know, around chronic wasting disease. And, you know, it's kind of been a, you know, back and forth with state rep, you know, state agency representatives and, you know, just personal opinions. And so as all of this is happening, there's a lot of new developments in this space. Uh, and so uh, our Most guest notably. Oklahoma, Oklahoma, which yeah. a lot of people have heard about grown dinosaurs out there, apparently. It's crazy. Uh, so joking, but apparently, and he can correct me, but like they have, I, I believe, approved, whether it's a bill or it may yeah. actually be in practice at this point. I think it's legislatively approved to, to go into effect next year. That there will be pen raised or farm raised deer who have been genetically selected mm -hmm. uh, to be uh, resistant to the CWD, whatever. Mm -hmm. Um Released into the wild. Released into the wild. Yep. Released into the wild. So yep. that's, that's happening statewide. Yeah. And so the reason for that is all, um, or a lot of it is, is coming off of uh, our guest, Dr. Chris Seabury from Texas A&M, uh, the vet school, uh, his research around the genome side of this. And, and basically uh, this uh, CWD uh, resistant gene that is showing up in, in certain deer and that's kind of been the the foundation of this. I mean, there's a lot of talk. There's been a ton of money spent on CWD, and you know, obviously, whether it doesn't matter which side of the spectrum you're on, whether it's from a deer farming side or from just a wild free ranging side, like the reality is, is we don't want deer to disappear, um, you know, from from Earth. So we need to figure out something. And so um, Dr. Seabury has led a team to to really look into this. And so today is kind of our chance to- so this, is a to ask, this is a learning episode Yeah, for get us. to ask questions and, yeah. and hear what, what you know, they've been working on and, and why they're so positive about what they have here. And again, to become into practice in Oklahoma in the near future. So let's get Chris on. 
Dr. Seabury, do we have you? Yes, I'm here. How are you? Um, <clears throat> doing good. We appreciate you coming on this this afternoon to spend a little time with us and talk about the uh, the big elephant in the room a lot of times in the whitetail space, CWD. Yeah, sure. I'm glad to <clears throat> I'm glad to answer any questions that I can and happy to be here. Where are y'all Where are y'all broadcasting from today? So we're just south of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, right now. Okay. Yeah. Very good. So in in the heart of traditional whitetail deer hunting space up here, and and also you know a state that still has a, a pretty heavy deer farming uh, business operation standpoint as well. Um, so it's kind of it's kind this the CWD thing has been you know really big here in Pennsylvania because of those two factors and and obviously in our state we've got you know the game commission responsible for the wild free ranging herd and we've got the Department of Agriculture responsible for the captive deer herd um and so obviously anytime you've got different groups in in the in the same hopper you've got conflicts and discussions and debates that tend to come with it right well i know your state veterinarian pretty well and uh he's a he's a smart guy so this particular topic cwd is unfortunately become highly politicized, which is a problem because <clears throat> for most of the people that enjoy science who are real scientists, you know, they got into science because it was a challenge. You were always learning something new. Um, there was a chance to be creative uh, in terms of solving problems and, and plans for solving problems. But most importantly, science is supposed to be about the pursuit of truth. And so therefore it's self-correcting. And um, I mean, I, I see social media posts and comments from people that are talking way outside of their lane and space all the time that it's just propaganda. Mm -hmm. and, and so I understand that it's difficult to be able to educate people um, because even us, we turn on our news. Sometimes we don't know what to believe depending on what channel you're watching. Right. Uh, but that, you know, there there is some strong and defendable and peer reviewed science in this space. So I'm happy to answer any questions that you want to pose. Awesome. So Chris, before we dig too deep into that, would you mind uh, just sharing with us your background? Uh, you're an act, you're currently a professor right at, at Texas A&M, I believe. Can you just share some of your credentials and kind of how you got to this point? Yeah. So I started out as a wildlife biologist. So I'm really had two degrees there and started working on um, wildlife genetics at, at, at that particular point. And then I went to a doctoral program at the vet school where I got a doctoral degree in population and quantitative genetics, got ready to go and take a federal job related to livestock genetic improvement. And um, A&M ended up having an opening and asked me to apply. And so I applied for that job and I've been there ever since. And so now <clears throat> I'm a tenured professor at the vet school at, at A&M. And most of my career has been spent on genetic improvement of livestock, food animals for uh, disease resistance and production traits. Now that, that gets the bills paid, right? Because there's a lot more funding in that space and there was a lot more technology uh, in that space. Um, but of course I've always had a love of wildlife. So I've worked on wildlife continuously while I've worked on livestock. Now, you, you know, you've got me here today to talk about something that where I've actually learned, I mean, used what we've learned and deployed in livestock. I'm using it in wildlife very successfully. So, um, I think that's, that's where we are today. That's what we'll be talking about and and so when you uh, obviously having that <laughs> background there uh, about how long ago did you know essentially this the cwd piece of the puzzle come across your desk how long have you guys been working on that in at texas a and I think in well first of all i should say that when i got my doctoral degree a large focus of my doctoral degree was the genetic components of prion diseases and I started that in 2001. I finished it in 2004. I also published something around 2004 
in elk that showed that the one mutation that they thought was most important for susceptibility or resistance in elk, which was codon 132 in the prion gene, I showed that there was uh, at least 30 other important genetic features um, that had to be taken into account that were equally predictive of susceptibility or resistance to CWD and elk. And so, I mean, I've been working in this space for, you know, 20 years <clears throat> yeah. on and off because I also worked on scrapey. I worked on um, BSE or mad cow and cattle, so on and so forth. And so with that, you know, obviously the scrapey side and mad cow, you know, those are the things that I think most people listening to this would say, well, those are the, you know, analogies that are used often in the CWD space um, or the, the relatability and, uh, and those just being because of the, the prion aspect of things is why they often get tied together. I, I couldn't hear all the question because you froze up, but I think what you were asking is, <clears throat> are all those diseases tied together because of the, the shared nature of the misfolded prion? Yeah, correct. And, and the answer is yes, but those, I mean, the diseases are not, you know, totally equivalent. I mean, the feed ban largely stopped mad cow when you could not render beaten meat and bone meal, you know, essentially recycling it and using it in feed that, that really all but stopped most of the, the BSE mad cow outbreak, but scrapey is, you know, fundamentally different, much more, uh, contagious. Um, and, you know, CWD also is more like scrapey than it is like BSE. So, mm. in fact, you know, many people believe that scrapey is probably one major origin, at least, of CWD. So, mm. um, you know, they do, they, they, there are noted similarities there between those two diseases. Yeah. So, when we, uh, you know, I think when we look back at the history of kind of CWD, we, we always kind of go back to that Colorado, um, you know, foundational study and, and mule deer. And, and I think oftentimes scrapies are mentioned because of sheep potentially being in that same area at the same time. Um, in your opinion, do you think that there is a link there? I, I don't really know exactly what happened at, at that Colorado research facility there's been efforts to try to find that out over the years. And I don't know that anybody has been super successful at getting all the details, but um, you know, it doesn't so much matter what happened there because there's been other studies since that time that, that look at how easy is it to give deer scrapey or how easy is it to give um, sheep CWD and so on and so forth. And looking at the molecular properties of the, of the agent of the disease, et cetera. And it's clear that, you know, in some cases, in some cases and in some um, Western blots of certain tissues, et cetera, the diseases are indistinguishable from one another. So, um, you know, it, I guess it doesn't really matter what you call it because scrapie is a reportable disease in sheep mm -hmm. um, and CWD is a reportable disease in deer. So uh, I just think it would be very naive to believe that, you know, CWD is just so uniformly special that none of the origin of CWD is rooted in scrapie. I think that would be extraordinarily naive. Yeah. And I mean, at this point in the country uh, or in the world, I mean, do it are, are scrapie, is that disease fairly call it under control in sheep populations at this point? It's believed to be largely under control, but, um, you know, in I think 2016 in Hartley County, Texas, we diagnosed a sheep with scrapie and within 30 days of diagnosing that sheep with scrapie um, or less than that, we diagnosed the first mule deer with CWD. And since that time we've had, a steady stream of CWD in that county first in mule deer and then starting to become present in white tail deer. Hmm. So, you know, you might, you, you know, trying to tie those things together, may be uh, circumstantial, but sure. when you look at the experimental evidence of, of trying to infect, you know, deer with scrapie or, 
or uh, sheep with uh, CWD or you know whatever, it you you do see that that is doable and not hard to do. Mm -hmm. So I think I think you know trying to split that hair on on first of all I doubt there's one singular origin because in most mammals that get these types of diseases they can get what's known as a sporadic case. Some people call it spontaneous. I don't like to call it that because. <clears throat> that gives people the impression that it just magically happens. And, and that's not really true. We know in humans, for instance, that the most um, common form of prion disease is sporadic CJD. And mm -hmm. it's known that there are certain underlying genetic risk factors that are associated with developing sporadic CJD and not just in the prion gene. So, uh, knowing that, knowing that a sporadic case has been described in other non-human mammals also um, and published would lead you to believe that that could be possible also in deer. Um, and then, of course, you know, w e even if scrapie was initially an origin, once that gets passaged through a deer, meaning you know, a deer, let's say a deer got scrapey long ago, became infected, shed the disease, gave it to another deer. That deer um, then uh, shed the disease, gave it to another deer, and it's been passaged many, many times. The agent will adapt to the host, right? And that adaptation to the host can make it look like, you know, modern day CWD. So, trying to <clears throat> split the hairs and assert a definitive origin for um, singular origin for CWD is really not a, mm -hmm. not really a fruitful endeavor. <clears throat> I'm, I'm going to back it up a little bit for, for, sure. for myself and for our listeners. Chris, so without, <clears throat> without comparing it to another similar like livestock disease, can you just give us a really basic explanation of what CWD is? Uh, how it manifests itself in animals, how lethal it is. Just give us a basic uh, understanding of the disease from your perspective. Well, it won't be my perspective. It'll be the established scientific peer-reviewed literature's okay. perspective, some of which is mine. But, okay. you know, the disease itself is caused by an accumulation of a misfolded protein called the prion. We refer to it as PRP CWD. And usually what happens in an infectious exposure where a deer is exposed to the actual agent, which was shed from another infected deer, they would either ingest or inhale um, misfolded prion, which would then be trafficked through the body and end up in places um, like where we test for the presence of the disease and elsewhere where it would amplify because what would happen is that misfolded prion that came from a external infectious exposure would encounter your normal cellular prion protein. And when it did, it would bind to it and it would refold it into this misfolded form. And that would accumulate and almost become toxic. Uh, it, it, it causes neurological uh, damage to, to uh, neurological or, or nervous system, certain tissues. And, you know, to me, when I look at it from a trait perspective, and I've done a lot of national programs for genetic improvement of a lot of traits, but, and I always compare them to traits in humans so that I can, you know, have some understanding of the trait architecture. When I look at CWD as a trait in deer, white-tailed deer, it looks like a metabolic syndrome to me. Hmm. It, it looks like the disease induces the accumulation of that misfolded prion you know, of course, it causes neurological uh, damage, but to me, it looks like a, a metabolic disorder as well. And so what happens is that oftentimes there will be motor neuron damage that occurs and the deer will actually then start having trouble um, swallowing or they will aspirate um, into their lungs um, either either aspects of, of a cud or just parts of, uh, of food and whatnot in their saliva, which can also include ruminal um, material, 
they'll aspirate that into their lungs and they will get a pneumonia. Hmm. Um, and, you know, but CWD does not cause sort of rapid and acute mortality. It doesn't. You know, when I compare that to, say, anthrax, we have regions of the state that have endemic indigenous anthrax in the soil, hmm. probably originating from the old colonial cattle drive and whatnot days. Um, and so when I see a big anthrax outbreak, I mean, there'll be there, there can be hundreds of dead carcasses just very rapidly on the landscape, right? on a particular single ranch, CWD does not cause dead loss like that at all. Mm -hmm. not, not even remotely close. And, and it, it certainly does not have such a rapid, acute uh, mortality that it would preclude reproduction either. So when you know that, you have to understand that, you know, Mother Nature does fix problems, but she doesn't overfix them. Mm -hmm. So... When Mother Nature issues a correction for a problem, the correction that she will issue biologically is the minimum correction necessary on average in the population to ensure that the species can sustain itself. Mm -hmm. So a disease that would cause such rapid mortality that it would preclude reproduction, um, that would cause a much more profound, rapid fixed by mother nature in the form of selection right mm -hmm. so um you know cwd is a chronic disease hence the name yeah so it will weaken a deer across time it will make them more prone to other types of problems like aspiration pneumonia and even other issues mm -hmm. um it will it, it can increase the mortality rate uh, all cause mortality rate um, because even if CWD itself does not cause sufficient neurological damage, um, there, there are other reasons why a deer could be weakened and die, you know, in relation to, to CWD. Um, I think that those are the most basic elements that I can describe to you. So, you know, I think it while people are listening to that and, and hopefully starting to make sense of it, you know, um, in a lot of the whitetail range, especially the mid uh, Midwest and Northeast, you know, we've experienced more hemorrhagic disease outbreaks, which, you know, uh, similar in terms of the, some of the catastrophic damage we see from like an anthrax in a Texas, you know, we see, you know, 40, 50 deer Even dead. this morning we're seeing Facebook posts. It's like EHD is rampant, you know, yeah. and, and often the two come up in this, the same conversation, even though they're very, so, right. you know, not similar. Whereas on the CWD side, guys who are in some of the most prevalent areas of Wisconsin or Arkansas or Missouri are just like, you know, we don't ever see any deer just dead laying around the properties. And and that tying back, I think, to what you're saying, Dr. Seabury, in the chronic form is that oftentimes, like, they're not just going to, there's not just going to be a ton of them that die and here they all are. Right. Well, I don't want to hijack the conversation into EHD and blue tongue, but I mean, one thing that I would tell you is that ties into the work that I've been doing is, you know, deer in the extreme South, for instance, very, you know, South Texas, real endemic deer there, not deer that were imported to the state, mm -hmm. you know, because every state has moved a lot of deer around and imported a lot of deer from other places historically before people became very concerned about CWD and they, they imported them and, and let them go on low fence. Right? Mm -hmm, right. So I'm talking about native, um, endemic indigenous genetic lines in the South. They've been living with EHD and blue tongue for hundreds and hundreds of generations. Okay. And so you cannot even harvest a deer during deer season in November or December that doesn't have antibodies hmm. to, all the major EHD and blue tongue uh, serotypes that you want to look for. Okay. Mm -hmm. Meaning that they were, they were sufficiently exposed to elicit an immune response, but they didn't die right. because they're naturally resistant. All right. Mm -hmm. And that's something that has been tuned up in their genetics over hundreds and hundreds of generations. Well, deer up North, they haven't had that. No. 
the, the, the native endemic indigenous genetic lines of deer up north, EHD and blue tongue is they're largely naive to the disease. The, the exposures and the, the presence of the biting midges that vector the disease have not, you know, they, they've not been constant up in the north. That's a more recent occurrence and spread mm -hmm. of the disease and the vector more recent generationally. So those deer are much more naive and it, it does elicit a much higher mortality rate um, up north. So, um, you know, we see in the south some of those deer when we look at their genetics using the technology and the research that we built we see that they are well built for cwd resistance and also well built for ehd and blue tongue resistance and it it seems to be that it might be a correlated trait mm. we see correlated traits in cattle all the time two traits that are totally different traits have different heritability estimates but yet they're correlated traits, right? Mm -hmm. And I mean, one example that comes to mind is um, if you're highly susceptible to respiratory disease in beef or dairy cattle, right? Then let's pretend that we go to a feedlot and we're going to look at beef cattle. Something that's highly susceptible to respiratory disease is going to is going to get it, go off feed. Its average daily gain will be poor. It'll have to be treated. Um, then it'll have to have a withdrawal time before it can go into the to the food chain, but it, that will wreck its productive value. That that disease susceptibility, right? Mm -hmm. Healthy animals produce better. So the animals that have sort of the best average daily gain and other traits often are the ones that are more durable and resistant to the major diseases that affect them. Mm -hmm. um, two totally different traits, but some correlated genetics and some trait correlation there. Um, we see some of the same thing in relation to EHD, blue tongue, CWD here in the South. The Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Hoyt. What can we say, man? Another year back with Hoyt. We're both shooting RX-8s. I'm shooting mm -hmm. 70 pounds in the bourbon, which I love bourbon. It's great. And you're shooting 80 pounds in the straight black. Blacked out as always, man. I got the, uh, so I'm shooting the 500 grain Easton Arrow this year. Uh, and at 80 pounds, I'm flinging that thing at like 300 feet per second. I mean, it's just, it's deadly. Put a water buffalo in front of me and he's done. I mean, we shot it earlier. You literally put an arrow through a brand new target, like never been shot before. I know. So one other thing that Hoyt is doing this year is they're making all their own strings in-house. And so the quality is top notch and it just really is something that is setting them apart from their competitors. Well, what we always try to do when we go to our bow shop, Ultimate Outdoors, is we try to shoot other bows just to make sure that we are really giving everybody a fair chance here. The reality is it's a no brainer. Hoyt, it stands above all of them every single time. Definitely. And so right now you can use code HUNTER, H-U-N-T-R, for 20% off any apparel on the Hoyt website. And as always, get serious, get Hoyt. So that's what I guess I was going to get into. You know, um, obviously we kind of opened the podcast talking about what's going on in Oklahoma, but if you could give us a, give us a background here on um, the research you, you all have done around this CWD uh, resistant gene, if we're classifying that correctly. Well, it's not one gene. Okay. Almost no, almost no trait that we care about as people is one gene. Okay. You know, if you want to talk about body mass index, human height, um, uh, athletic performance, intelligence, none of the traits that we're interested in are single gene traits. And a lot of people that don't understand that or aren't geneticists and want to dabble in genetics. They can't seem to get over that. They, they, they always want to go back to one gene. It's not one gene. There's literally thousands of different naturally occurring genetic variants that contribute to either enhanced susceptibility or enhanced resistance to CWD in deer and other cervid species um, that we're working on. So, what we do is we go out and we get a set of training data. And in this case, the training data is from 30 different CWD positive facilities that were farms all across the United States that were depopulated mm -hmm. and had postmortem diagnostic testing. Um, and they ended up, of course, their CWD positive or their CWD non-detect. And we use those data to 
determine what alleles or what genetic variants with a TS, what genetic variants all over all the chromosomes across the whole genome, which ones contribute to susceptibility and which ones contribute to resistance. Mm. And once we know that, we can even estimate and quantify how much they contribute to either resistance or susceptibility. And then we can take a sample, a new sample after that, and we can sum up all of those little allelic effects, right? So if the deer is enriched for the good stuff, then it'll produce an estimated breeding value that is negative. If the deer is enriched for genetic variants with a TS or alleles that increase susceptibility, then uh, that deer will produce a genomically estimated breeding value that is a positive number. And what we see is that if we combine selection on two things, codon 96 and the, the genomically estimated breeding value, if we focus on those two things using genome-wide data, then, and we make a rule about you know, selective breeding and keeping deer, then what we see is that less than 1% of the deer in our recipe, less than 1% are among the positives nationwide. Hmm. And, you know, all that's backed up with science that shows the direction of the effect. We did, you know, we did blind uh, validation tests where we blindly predict on animals and you know, I think the average accuracy was 88% wow. blindly, you know? So if you, if you think about that, then if you fully implement that and you think about it, then, you know, you know, right away that you can probably prevent or reduce the incidence of the disease by somewhere in the 80% or, or, or greater um, uh, metric, you know, then it becomes valuable to, to use especially in captive herds where you have, you know, total control over mm -hmm. ingress, egress, and mm -hmm. hopefully you've got total control and good control on aspects of biosecurity. Right. So, that makes um, sense. So, so, yeah, I mean, that's, that's sort of where we are. It's a very, it, it's an applied project, but all the underlying biology that we learn by, by doing it makes it, you know, important probably for other diseases because we see things that tie in with Alzheimer's. We see things that tie in with Parkinson's. You mm -hmm. know, there's there's some shared biochemistry there. Um, not to say that CWD is, is like those diseases, but to say when it comes to diseases that cause neurodegeneration, there mm -hmm. are some there is some shared biochemistry there. Hmm. Um, so we learn a lot but we try to do things that are also have some applied value as well. So in that validation side of it, um, you're basically seeing that there are certain individuals in the population who just genetically are more susceptible to CWD than others. Yeah. And by a lot and probably almost certainly, you know, the minimum infective dose that's required to get an animal started in the what we would call the the pathophysiology of the disease or mm -hmm. to just kick the disease off you know highly highly susceptible animals are going to need minimal exposure and they're going to progress through the disease very rapidly mm -hmm. um, and those animals that are increasingly durable th they'll progress more slowly through the disease but they have to get a much they, they need a bigger dose mm -hmm. and and they need probably, you know, often repeated doses. They will overwhelm them. We've we've seen that, right? Where yep. you get a farm that has some decent genetics, but they have a lot of bad genetics. And so those those deer, you know, they, they're easily infected. They rapidly progress and they become super shedders and provide huge daily dose exposures to all the other deer that are in the pen with it. Mm -hmm. And of some of the deer with better genetics get overwhelmed, but um, but if the poor if the deer with poor genetics were never there, you might not have had an an incident at all. Hmm. You know, and and so 
we've done we've done very specific analyses on disease progression. So uh, we know exactly how the genetics works for that as well. Um, and the, the validation part is there's multiple sets of validation we did. One is one is a machine learning approach where we have a we take a computer program that will re- randomly segment the samples along with their genetic data and it'll rewrite it into a total new project where all the diagnostic data from one one segment of the samples will be overwritten into missing and then we'll try to predict whether or not they were cwd positive or non-detect based only on their on their genetics on their genomically Mm -hmm. estimated breeding values and we'll do that many times 50 or 100 times and then look on average how well did we do and what was the standard deviation of of the accuracy and we find that that works very well you know well over 80 percent accuracy but then another way we did a validation was to have usda aphis just send us blind samples and, and 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 they said you tell us which ones are most likely to be cwd positive mm-hmm. you know you tell us so when i would get those samples and we'd run the technology produce the breeding values we have some different ways that we did this and different rules that we developed about uh, scoring and whatnot, mathematical rules, then we would send them back a, an Excel file that had samples that were moderately to highly susceptible or susceptible enough. Mm-hmm. We would highlight them red and we'd say, look, if, if there's any positives that are in this group of samples, we expect to find most or all of them among the red highlighted samples. And sometimes I caught 100% that way. Sometimes I caught 80% that way. But on average, we did many batches like that, almost 800 samples. And I think that we blindly flagged 88% of the positives using that method. Wow. That's crazy. Um, How many like genetic factors, I think you called them alleles, uh, are you guys considering? You say, hey, there's what are 50 or a hundred of them that we look at and there's a handful that we feel are th- like the most highly attributable to, to the disease. Am I thinking about that the right way? So we have two technologies. Yes. And one of them looks at, one of them looks at 200,000 different genetic locations across all the chromosomes in each deer. <laughs> Nothing. And each one of those locations has two alleles that are present for every animal. Wow. So you got 400,000 alleles that you're looking at per animal. Wow. And an allele is, um, is a part of the, of the chain of DNA. Is that right? Well, yeah, because like if we looked at, if, if we, if we sequenced your DNA and we looked at say chromosome one, we would see parts of chromosome one that you got from your father that are different from parts of chromosome one that you got from your mother. Mm-hmm. There would be two different DNA bases at a particular location. Like, Maybe your dad gave you nucleotide A and your mom gave you nucleotide C, right? So we look at 200,000 locations like that across all the chromosomes uh, in our big R&D technology, which we used for all these initial about validations we discussed. Then we built a smaller technology that's about 60,000, and we're adding on to it. Um, that made it much more affordable to be deployed for stakeholder usage right? Um, and for usage in regulatory capacities. Mm-hmm. And um, But it was a little bit of a trick to find 60,000 that could predict with similar accuracy as yeah. 200,000, right? Yeah. That's wild. And so like of the 200,000 locations, is it like, uh, you know, 50,000 of those locations matter or certain aspects of every one of those locations matter? A lot of them matter. And Mm -hmm. the best way for me to explain it without getting into the weeds is that there's tens of thousands that tens of thousands that have non-zero effects on on susceptibility or resistance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. So basically parts of a lot of them matter. Cool. I, I mean, can a you- lot of people, a lot of people don't understand this because 
they say to themselves, well, wait a minute. <clears throat> if, if the only problem here is that this, this protein is misfolding, you know, why don't we just through genetic engineering, put a knockout into this gene mm -hmm. and just take this gene out. So it doesn't make this protein anymore, because if we do that and it's not producing protein in the body, that's normal then it can't be refolded into this aberrant form if it encounters it in the body, right? Mm -hmm. Well, the, there's there's about three or four problems with that. Number one... <laughs> Why don't you just unfold it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, there is a chemical way that that has been described in the literature, but in hmm. uh, a way for dealing with that in the cell's trash can, I think that kind of ties into the work that we've done and we've described some of that, but... but the, some of the problems with that approach are number one, no DNR is going to go for that. Right. Those, those, those are genetically modified organisms. They're going to, mm -hmm. they'll, they'll freak out about it. They don't want them in the wild. Um, more importantly, number two, the protein is doing something. Um, we have even published a paper in PNAS that would, you know, speak to that a long time ago. And, you know, people have not properly evaluated these animals when they do make these knockouts to make sure that, everything is physiologically normal. So right. you wouldn't want to find out that there's a defect later. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and number three, anytime you do any genetic engineering, um, <clears throat> the FDA considers that like a new drug that has to be proven to be safe. Yeah. And it's just a mess. And that's just not what I do. I go out and I find the best of what mother nature has to offer. And once we identify what the best is, um, we just select for the best of what's natural and what's already there. That's what we do in cattle. That's what we're doing here. Mm. It's no, there's no manipulation. Yeah. That's a propaganda word that's used to try to insinuate that we're modifying or manipulating the genetics. But all we're really doing is selecting on the best of what is natural and what is there. I that, think yeah. that's an important distinction. I mean, that was a kind of a turning point mm -hmm. for me. And like, when I first heard it described, I'm like, Oh, I get these GMO deer out here. It's like, we're, we're modifying, we're doing this and we're that it's CRISPR, mm -hmm. but that's a lie. Right. I, I talked to, I don't know if they're colleagues of yours, but some, some farmers from Oklahoma and stuff like that, that they were like, well, no, it, listen, all we're doing is, is basically expediting natural selection. You know, these deer that are highly susceptible, you know, will die of this de disease or a, a coexisting, you know, whatever over a matter of time. And the less susceptible gene w will prevail o over the long term. And so we're just trying to, that was how it was described to me was that you guys are just trying to expedite that. And Oklahoma is basically the first ones to be implementing that. Well, the the deal in Oklahoma that I mean, I, I can't take credit for that. That was that was the will of the people that decided they learned about what I was doing. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> they had me come over and explain the science. I asked a bunch of questions and they themselves, their state reps and their stakeholders decided that they were going to do this, this bill, if you will. And it 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 sort of was tailored after something that I had done which is that I looked at all the genetics of the wild deer in the state of Texas. Yeah. And I compared them to the genetics of breeder deer nationwide and in Texas to, to understand, you know, how susceptible are the deer. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so I explained all that to them. And I think that from that and the published science and what I've made available to the breeders, they, came up with this idea about what you're discussing that they turned into a law. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Some people, some people don't like that. Um, and, you know, I, I guess what I would say is, you know, there are some people who are, you know, even wildlife biologist colleagues of mine who are ideologically and philosophically opposed to placing deer and exotics into lawful agricultural practices, mm -hmm. i.e. breeding, mm -hmm. high fencing, but they're also opposed to, to turning them loose in the wild. So they say that there's going to be something wrong with the genetics or, you know, there, there's, there's no genetic um, danger. I mean, for instance, in the state of Oklahoma, their wildlife people told me that all the wild deer in that state were, we're actually um, that that all of the currently extant living 
white-tailed deer in that state were had emanated from about 500 deer that the population in the state had gotten down to about 500 Mm -hmm. at one time and so you know you would be increasing heterozygosity if you introduce some new deer that you know that that could actually of course um, heterozygosity yeah you you could actually (laughs) there, there could be some benefits there for you know for those deer by having some new deer there and Mm-hmm. You know, people people go out and they historically they've imported deer from all kinds of other states and sure. turned them loose in the wild, just to in just for the sole purpose of of increasing the the huntability of the deer and the and the state profits on licensing and just to give their state residents a better hunting experience. Mm-hmm. You know that that's been done historically and nobody really really talks about that so you know this is one of those things that comes down to the will of the people in the state and if they want to use the science then they can use the science um if somebody has some sort of concern about what they're doing and it's a valid concern i'll be the first person to say it's a valid concern but Mm -hmm. uh, i've heard all kinds of wacky statements about you know how you know, the genetics, you know, that just weird things, misuse of terms and how the genetics um, will be a problem for the wild deer. And none of those things are really true. Well, I think from a wild deer standpoint, most people up until this point have had concerns around, you know, moving and or releasing deer because of things like CWD, right? They didn't want somebody moving a potentially CWD positive deer from a captive facility and then releasing it into the wild. Obviously, in this case, the whole point of this is to have deer that are less susceptible to the disease being put into the wild. Um, so, you know, it it, it kind of trumps the what has been, I think, the card that's been played for so long, which is what, what, what is, what is the reason? I'm sorry. What is the reason that, like, I guess it's just like uh, rumblings or it's like, I guess I don't know where the pushback for this is coming from, but certainly we've heard like, wow, you know, that, that's, uh, it, it's, it's highly, uh, there, there's controversy, you know, around what's, what's happening in Oklahoma. And it's like, what, what is the reason for that? I mean, is the, is there, is there science that like contradicts it? Like, you know, it's, it's obviously public, like you guys have made it public in papers and stuff like that. Um, who's contesting it and why in the face of the science, I guess. Well, I don't, I mean, I might be the best person to speak to this because, you know, some of these wildlife folks either forget or don't know that I also am a wildlife biologist, but they, they think of me more of as an animal breeder and a livestock, you know, genetic selection Mm -hmm. breeder, you know, guy. And, but that's not really true. And so I don't know how, I don't know that I want to get too deep in the weeds, but there are ideological and philosophical differences about what is acceptable. And some wildlife biologists are more of what I would consider purists or, you know, conservation ideologists in in a very pure way. And they just don't, they, they somehow think that turning captive deer loose into the wild, um, you know, is, is, is damaging the purity of the wild deer, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's one problem. And uh, another problem, but you know, if that were the case, then they didn't have a problem importing deer from all kinds of other states. Right. Historically. right. Yeah. Historically, but that's what established all these populations. And but, but it's, it's like the a, high a lot of the breeding, them, right? Like I believe in Pennsylvania, definitely in Ohio. I mean, we've had and talk, Mississippi, talk Wisconsin, to Tonk. Yeah, yeah, all of these states have had like massive, uh, mm-hmm. you know whatever ingressive it's restocking restocking efforts Uh right and 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 you know some of that probably brought some cwd but there wasn't a lot of thought that was given to it back then and yeah probably and and you know so anytime you translocate deer in any kind of way you can certain you know there there certainly is a non-zero risk of 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 moving any disease around i mean Mm -hmm. that's that's obvious but the other thing that strikes me is that you know, from a from a wildlife point of view, on low fence, a free ranging situation, there's been no scientific discoveries that have been made, zero, that provide any sort of technology or management level tool 
that will allow them to suppress CWD in those wild environments. And so well, I actually think that... Sure there is. Yeah, they say kill them all. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, wait a minute, I'm getting to that. Yeah. And so I actually think that some people are embittered by the fact that they're, that they're you know, that their purest mortal enemy may have a, a, a tool that they can effectively use because they have much more control over their captive deer herd, mm -hmm. both in ingress, egress, directed breeding, biosecurity, you know? And so they, they don't like that because believe it or not, I, I, you know, I'm not sure that everyone in the game wants to solve the problem. Everyone in the game might want to keep the grant money coming forever. Right. And make very small incremental changes or discoveries mm -hmm. and just keep it flowing. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I don't have to pay my salary from grants. So when I get a grant, I don't, I don't need that grant to keep myself paid on a monthly basis. Some of the people that work in this space, they, they do need the money, right? They, they need their, their, their job in part is to go get money to work on research so they can pay for a tangible part of their salary. So there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of things in the background that, that people don't know. And, um, you know, getting back to the, we'll just go kill them all. Well, that's, that's just taking hunting opportunities away from people. It's turning people off of hunting. You get a recruitment problem after that mm -hmm. because, you know, nobody wants to go out hunting and never see a deer, you know? Sure. I mean, there's no faster way to turn off, you know, a new hunter than to go hunting and never, ever see the game you're looking for. Right. Seeing the game you're looking for is success in hunting. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, even if you're not going to harvest an animal, just seeing what you're there to harvest is success. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, like the thing that I think everyone should think about is this right now where CWD already has very, you know, tangible prevalences. There's probably a point along the way where the prevalence climbs in the wild, where you could actually where you could actually sort of. Uh, truncate it and knock it down through a combination of re removing animals, reducing the density, but then restocking with the with better animals, you know, who aren't going to rapidly progress and become super shedders and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. But but I never, you know, I never bring that idea up and I never push that idea because because it seems to invoke such a strong negative emotional response from some of my wildlife colleagues. But what is the alternative? Yeah. You have your wild populations reach 30, 40 percent prevalence. And what happens when you pass the point of no return? And now you've got so much of the agent in the environment that you can't even if you put the you know most durable deer that you can find genetically out there, maybe one in three of those still might get it, you know? Mm. Or you know, one in four or one in five, you know, I mean, I guess that's an improvement, but, you know, just letting it sort of d doing nothing, which is what we're doing, mm -hmm. doing nothing is, I don't know that that's really a, I don't know that that's really a, the best approach. So I think Oklahoma is trying to, they're, they're in an experimental phase where they're trying to do something preventative. Yeah. And, you know, there are other states that have such incredible problems with CWD that I don't know what they may not. They don't have the same options. They may or may not have the same options. We just don't yeah. know yet. Right. I, I don't know if anybody knows. I mean, like we talk a lot to d people from different states and stuff, uh, you know, w whether they're involved with CWD efforts uh, directly, like through through the DNR or. Mm -hmm at the state level, but, but then also just people who, you know, are, are passionate outdoorsmen and, and hunters from those states. And there just seems to be such a disagreement or like, uh, you know, they're not on the same page about whether CWD is like a problem or not. Even they're like, you know, some people like on, on one side, you have all the deer will be dead in 30 years. And on the other side, you have, has that happened? They're going to be fine. Yeah. yeah. No, it hasn't happened. No, it, it, yeah, clearly it's not happened. Let, let me let me make a very important point right now for you and your viewers, because nobody, I don't think anybody's ever told you this before, and I want you to remember this. 
if there's one thing I want you to remember, it's this. Mother Nature does not care how many four and five and six year old age class trophy bucks you have. She doesn't care about that. So even if CWD leads to a um, reduction in the average age of the herd over time, Mother Nature doesn't care about that. Mother Nature will fix the problem just only well enough to ensure the perpetuation of the species, right? Mm -hmm. So that, that, that reproduction, sufficient reproduction can occur. And, and so she doesn't care about all these other problems. So, you know, when you, when you talk about um, CWD, you know, is going to just, you know, it's going to eradicate all your deer. It, I don't, I don't really believe that that's happening. I mean, show me one state where that's happened because even when they've killed off all the deer in a particular area, thinking they're going to eradicate the disease. And then they have deer that move back into that area where the disease is in the soil and they begin to get it and then they repopulate there. I mean, there's lots of states that have lots of deer, mm -hmm. um, even with high prevalences of, of CWD. So, you know, the, is it a problem? Yes. Is, is the problem, you know, so fantastic and, and sensational that all deer are going to disappear uh, from North America? No. Yeah. I don't believe so. So, I mean, it seems like the, you know, the, the theory in that is that the disease being a chronic disease, reproduction is going to outpace it. If I was at a, I was at a meeting where I was asked to testify and there were two other people that testified after me who said the same thing that you just mentioned, that the reproductive capacity of a whitetail can outpace the mortality induced by CWD. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, again, can you, can you, reduce the total numbers of deer that you have in your upper age classes where you're looking for your trophies? Yes. Uh, well, can't, is it possible that mother nature could incrementally fix that across time? Yes. But it estimates on how long could be hundreds of years. Right. Cause she doesn't care about that. Yeah. That's not her goal. That's your goal. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. And so if you go out and you propagate the most durable deer, you know, those are going to be the deer that, have the highest chance of, you know, reaching those higher age classes that mm -hmm. where you desire them and, and making that age structure more diverse. Um, From a purity standpoint, like, cause it's an interesting, you know, take on it. I, I, I just like weighing how I feel about it. I, I don't personally think I would care if deer are originated in a farm or not. I mean, if that meant the, the, the continuation of like a mature, uh, age class first hunt, I, I would be just not opposed to that. Generally speaking, I think where, you know, where I start to be like, well, I don't, I don't know about that would be like, uh, what, co what comes with it in terms of like, okay, so what does that mean? Or, you know, I look at farm deer, pen raised deer, and just the, the stereotype that we have of them is they're, they're just like gigantic antler deer. Like they're just, a lot of them are bred for like the maximum scoring potential and mm -hmm. whatever. And, that's where I'm like, well, I don't, I, I, you know, that, that's where I feel like I'm like, well, I, I wouldn't want to see that in a wild herd. Like it's clearly, uh, fa it's fabricated or it's been bred for. So, I mean, I don't know. Is that something that you account for and, or that a Ho Oklahoma has in, in their releasing? I don't. So I never, I never saw their bill and any of that until after it was already done. Right. Mm -hmm. So I didn't, you know, I, I didn't participate in like okay. the, the drafting of the bill. I never saw it till it was done. Mm -hmm. So I can't really, I can't answer questions about that. But what I can say is, you know, these big non-typical deer that you're talking about are still natural genetics. I mean, those genetics are out there in the wild. They're just not common, right? And so in a captive breeding, you can make them more common and have more of them, right? Um, and I personally prefer deer that are, you know, more typical. In fact, I like really tall deer, you know, um, as opposed to really wide deer that usually have shorter tines. I like a, I, I like a deer that maybe isn't so wide, but is really tall mm -hmm. and typical. Those are the kind of deer that really, you know, take my breath away. But, 
Um, I don't, I don't think that, you know, the most effective way to do something like that would be to use bread doughs and just let them mm-hmm. have doughs that are bread and let them fawn in the pasture where they're going to live, wherever that would be. Right. And, and, you know, that would be the, that would be the most sort of best natural way to do it. Yep. And I don't think that you would have these just, you know, monstrosity, uh, deer that, that are, you know, gargantuan with, with highly non-typical antlers walking around because, sure. you know, there's too much stress in that external free ranging environment. And there's often, yeah. they may not get the same quality of nutrition and, you know, they're going to be moving around a lot more and, hmm. you know, it, it, it it's just going to be totally different, you know? And so at least it'll be somewhat different. And so I just don't think that that's the expectation of what you're going to get. Yeah. You're probably from right. Something like that. But I, but I would also point to like this, like when I think about it, if there's a really a decent implied purpose for doing it, how is it really different from aquaculture? I mean, mm-hmm. we produce all I've kinds of this fish whole time. In, yep. in our state that we stock into rivers and into mm-hmm. the bay and in saltwater bay and into rivers and and you know we we do that massively and that's done elsewhere massively and you know the first thing that wildlife biologists do with a threatened or or, or more of a endangered species is to capture them Cap- captively it. propagate mm-hmm. them and then restock them so you know this highly negative emotional response to this problem is kind of a litmus test for scientific logic versus Mm -hmm. something else i mean if you know if the problem is really so acute and so bad why why would you limit yourself and how you would solve the problem yeah in terms of like a population size right on a landscape level have you all started to look at models from a you know how many of these you know uh least susceptible animals would need to be released into a free range uh, population for it to start to propagate across the animals in there to really actually change those herd dynamics, I guess. Well, it, it would take a little bit more. So like if you did the bread dough sort of approach, mm-hmm. you'd probably want to put ear tags into those bread doughs that maybe purple ear tags so people knew that it wasn't lawful to harvest those animals, right? Right, yeah, because you don't want to take all the effort to put them in and only for them to be shot six months later. Right, Mm -hmm. and so that's really the best thing to do. And, you know, I mean, we, here in Texas, as an example, there's something that has been done historically called DMP or deer management pens where people, people would, would, would catch does in a, in a pen, breed them to a, to a superior breeder buck and then turn the does loose. Right. Mm -hmm. And to upgrade the genetics on their ranch. And, and that was extraordinarily effective. I Mm -hmm. mean, extraordinarily effective. So if you're putting out bred does on sort of free ranging uh, pasture or environment, Mm -hmm. That's just a bigger DMP pen. I mean, if you put enough bread does out, it, I, I, I mean, by my calculations, if people aren't harvesting these does and they, you know, there are some that have greater livability traits than others. And if we assume that you're using those, I think you can, you know, move the needle quite a bit pretty yeah. fast. Yeah. You know, that makes sense. Yeah. Cause I think that's probably what, you know, it, everybody's trying to look at flaws to this thing. You know, I think the disease thing is kind of out the door, which has always been the, like, don't move deer, don't transport deer, don't You should have told deer. him out of the gate. Jeremy is a wildlife biologist, has a degree. That's my background. It's yeah. his background, yeah. Not actively practicing, but, mm-hmm. like, wh- what do you think about all this? I mean, it's, it. you know, I hear I hear from both sides, right? And and I try to take in, because I'm a science guy by, by the end of it, right? I just, I want the science Bill Nye. to, like, you know, speak the truth here. I think that the justifications from a purity standpoint um, are not good enough, right? We've we've gone how many years of 
what I would say is very little progress. Purity in CWD. Meaning mainly the objection to mixing farm raised deer Correct. from wild deer. Correct. Okay. And or doing the techniques that they're doing now to reduce CWD or prevent C- it. It doesn't seem to work. Right. Right. It, clearly. Um, from the other side, why I asked the question on the population standpoint is like, you know, if you take five deer and you release them on a thousand acre ranch, like it, it's going to take a while uh, for those herd dynamics to change. Right. So that there's there's definitely both sides of it that I see. But I mean, if you're telling me that the deer that you're releasing uh, isn't infected with CWD, which has been the number one reason that I think all wildlife biologists on the other side take away the money aspect of it, don't want those deer released is because they're afraid that that deer is CWD and it's going to spread in the herd. Yeah. Um, but that's it's, it's definitely it's definitely a disadvantage. Not that I would ever accuse anybody, but like that some of these organizations do have financial incentive to continue to get grant money. I mean that doesn't yeah. help their argument. Well, and I mean I think Dr. Seabury's point on the political side. The other one is, and I mentioned it kind of at the beginning, is most of these uh, DNR and agencies are separate from Department of Ag, and Department of Ag often has control on the captive herds in those states whereas obviously the other agency has the free range in mind and so when you have those split agencies you know that that becomes a political thing well the the real problem here is people not cwd exactly that's that's what it comes down to well the i mean it's uh, from a scientific point of view you either just need to learn to live with it and accept it and if that means you don't have older age class deer and trophies and that's what you're left with um you know whatever because you know if mother nature is going to fix the problem she has a a a very specific objective that doesn't match people's objective and Mm -hmm. people have a zero tolerance policy for cwd whereas mother nature does not have a zero tolerance policy for cwd and so you got to decide you know, what What are we working toward here? Which, which of the objectives do we need to work toward here? And if we want to work on both, tamp down CWD, you know, and, and get some things that we want, like livability, survivability of deer, yeah. have a nice age structure because the deer are more resistant, then, you know, that, waiting for that to happen naturally is we're all going to be dead. Yeah. So, um you know, and this, what we're doing is what's been done in sheep. We're just actually doing it in a more sophisticated approach. They mm-hmm. could have rapidly, they could have done this, the scrapey sort of eradication much more rapidly if they would have done it the way that we're doing it would have worked mm-hmm. um, even better than the way that they did it. If they would have done it the way that we're doing it, although the diseases are not exactly the same, but but uh, in in each species. But yeah, I mean, people are the problem here. It'd be different if you could show me some real in the field evidence of CWD causing massive die offs and population numbers decreasing rapidly and significantly. Um, You know, when when people even do when they do modeling and they say, oh, well, deer are going to be extinct in 30 years or, mm-hmm. you know, we see, you know, we see a decline in deer numbers somewhere up north due to CWD. Well, they almost never put a variable in there for environmental changes. Like maybe the last two years they've had record snowpack, right? right? Yeah. And so they don't account for, they don't account for the reduction in numbers that could be attributable to record snowfall for the last two years for instance or more right? significant diseases like ehd yeah or wolves yeah, they don't they don't account for any changes or that wolves, they yeah. see they any changes that they see they automatically attribute to cwd mm-hmm. right right and that that's really not statistically sound or biologically sound so um you know i i just don't Am I, I'm not a CWD alarmist. I recognize that it's a real disease. I recognize that it can kill deer. And uh, I recognize that we need practical solutions, right? Mm-hmm. But 
you know, practical solutions to complex problems are usually not simple solutions. Yeah. Simple solutions to complex problems are usually wrong. The Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Lone Wolf Custom Gear. Man, Jared, we are tree stand fanatics, and I think the one thing that we have learned over all these years is to kill big bucks, we got to be mobile. We've been hunting out of Lone Wolves for many years, the original Lone Wolf, and then obviously with the custom gear stuff, we were using the .5 and the .75. Yeah. And the one thing that we talked about is like, what if there were no cables? Here we are. I really just don't know how you can beat it, frankly. But, you know, a lot of that came to from a relationship that we've built with the Duquestos. We've had both Cody and Andre on the podcast a few times. The passion for hunting, the outlook on on the sport and stuff, I think is, is eye to eye with how we look at it. Everything that has gone into building this brand and to building these tree stands is something that we want to be a part of. This is the 40th anniversary of these guys creating tree stands that have been critical to how we hunt whitetail deer today. If you look over the past, you'll see Andre's designs being implemented across so many stands over the years such a cool thing but really has changed the way that we all hunt whitetail deer from above now right now you can use code hunter h-u-n-t-r to get seven percent off anything on the entire website be the lone wolf so one of the questions i was going to have for you is uh and i don't know if this is true or not i guess we're hearing it third party from from other people is um uh, people are saying that uh, it, whether it's the sequence uh, that, that you all are re realizing in the less susceptible deer is starting to show up in wild populations with high prevalency rates. Does that sound familiar to you? You froze up oh. and it was breaking up okay. and I'll, I couldn't hear the no, question. I'll, I'll restate it for you. So we've kind of heard this third party, but it sounds like... Um, Whatever this, this the CWD resistant gene. Well, it's not a gene. Well, now. whatever. Yeah, the sequence that you're seeing for the less susceptible deer is showing up in wild populations where CWD prevalence is high. Is it showing up? Is it natural? Oh. Is it naturally like natural occurring? Naturally occurring, <laughs> essentially, in in those populations. That I guess maybe that's one of the counters, Doctor Seabury, that people are saying is they're like, well, we're now starting to see this already in areas where CWD prevalence is high? So I don't, I, I, <clears throat> I don't know what the nature of the question is, but I think that I know part of it. So, okay. so for instance, when we run our 200,000 genetic marker technology, mm -hmm. we can also ask the research question, um, what, among these 200,000, which ones are most strongly associated with resistance to CWD? Mm -hmm. Well, the number one um, location is codon 96 in the prion gene of white-tailed deer, and specifically the 96S allele, okay? Okay. Um, that's ranked number one. It's It's got about 30 to 50 times the allelic effect size of the average effect across all of the alleles, right? Got it's it. 30 to 50 times stronger, mm -hmm. highly significant. Yep. And <clears throat> if we go look in Arkansas, right, we published that in 2020. We had that done in 2019. And then a group, including Jen Ballard, who I think is their wildlife and state vet in Arkansas, published a paper that showed that the 96S allele is naturally significantly increasing in is. frequency in the Arkansas hot zone, right? Yep, there it is. And so that, that in fact is true, but you know, they're only looking at that genetic feature. Other genetic features are also, also changing, right? Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> here's the problem. If we go up North, all right. Deer are almost uniformly 96 GG up north. 75% of the wild deer in the state of Texas carry at least one 96 S allele. Hmm. Almost no deer have 96 S in wild free ranging deer up north. Hmm. Okay. So, there have been people who have modeled or tried to model or estimate how long it would take mother nature to fix this problem based on the selective advantage and the selection coefficient 
related to <clears throat> some of these features, right? Mm -hmm. And they had to make assumptions because they didn't have all the knowledge we have now. Right. But it was hundreds of years, hundreds of years. Yeah. So, um, you know, if the argument is that, you know, it's not necessary to, 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 to do this or, or to, to do any sort of captive propagation and restocking, um, you know, if that's because mother nature is going to do it, then why are we spending hundreds of millions of dollars trying to manage CWD in wild populations? I mean, yeah, it, 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 it and I use the term management loosely because surveillance is not management. All right. No management implies that you're going to actually do something that has a tangible effect on whatever it is that you're managing for. Right. Mm -hmm. And so surveillance is not management by itself. And, you know, like I said, I don't, I don't go out. I, this is the most that I've talked about. This, this is the only time I've talked about restocking, but I don't go out and push that idea. Sure. I, I purposely don't because it, it invokes such a negative emotional response that people become completely irrational. And I just don't have time for that, <laughs> nor do I generally have a lot of tolerance for that. So I mainly focus on estimating how susceptible wild populations are. Yeah. So that if they want to do surveillance, they can tailor the surveillance to regions where the deer maybe are inherently more susceptible. Um, or I focus on um, breeding toward greater resistance and durability in the in the captive breeding populations to suppress the disease. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't I don't go around pushing this idea of captive uh, restocking because it <clears throat> it it what I find is that it makes it difficult to have a real logical scientific conversation about CWD. Yeah. The logic and the rationality ends yep. at the at the point where that gets mentioned. Yeah, there's too many emotions that get pulled in, people emotions, right? Not not logically yeah. thinking from a biological <clears throat> standpoint, but people emotions brought in at play at that point. Right. I mean, it seems pretty black and white to me. Like have you have you ever debated anybody who is on the <laughs> other side of it or like has any has there ever been an event where something like that was held? It was like a, a secret uh, deer scientist meeting. <laughs> no, not really. They're I mean, not secret. They you know, what, what I see most of all is that people will get out and they'll, they'll make sound bites and they'll do little articles and they'll say things that are, you know, completely technically wrong mm -hmm. and technically indefensible. And I'll write them a letter and the letter will have all the references to the peer reviewed literature that shows that they don't know what they're talking about. And yeah. then I'll never, I'll never hear from them again. That's a lot of times they won't do that again. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes they will. And then, so maybe I have to do it in public, but I mean, you know, in some cases, the magnitude of people's opinions is inversely proportional to what they really know. Right. They're way outside their lane and they're making statements way outside their areas of expertise. Yeah. And so, hmm. and it's, it must be motivated by either emotion or ideology mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I'm not doing that. Yeah. Or funding, unfortunately. Yeah. So what, uh, <clears throat> you know, I know, I know you weren't directly involved with the Oklahoma project or the creation of that bill, but uh, in your opinion, I mean, what, what does success look like? for the state of Oklahoma and how directly does that lead, you know, to a course for other states to <clears throat> do, do something similar? What would they say? Hey, this is a win. This is working. So I think I can <clears throat> answer that question first in part with an example. We have CWD here in the state of Texas. What we don't have is, is a rampant raging CWD in our wild populations. Part of the reason is that our deer are built differently than deer up north. I, I talked a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know that I ever really expect for us to have 
a raging CWD problem equivalent to what we see in some of the northern states and our wild free ranging deer for that reason. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I think what Oklahoma is doing is they are trying to essentially restock in their wild populations to a point that they too would be in the same boat. Um, because, you know, you start to get in some of those genetics up there that are shared with some states north of Oklahoma, and you start to see a higher frequency of um, some of the alleles that are definitely associated with susceptibility. So I think <clears throat> I think what they're hoping to achieve is what we just naturally have at the moment here in Texas as an example. Mm -hmm. I mean, you might read about um, you know, CWD and breeding facilities, but most of the time, you know, CWD and breeding facilities starts off as a single case, right? Mm -hmm. And then if you get in a dispute or legislate or, 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 um, if you get in a dispute or you, or, or you get into a lawsuit with the regulators and you do nothing about it, then yeah, you might end up with a lot of individual cases there. You know, about half of the cases in the state have come from like two two positive facilities for the most part right that that you know entered into disputes and right. and didn't didn't necessarily do what we know to do now whereas on the other hand um there was a positive facility that legislators told me to go and see if i could clean it up and i did we haven't had a single positive case for more than four years now Wow. And, and it was a combination of the genetic technology with best management practices and best, best biosecurity policies. And, uh, you know, that, that's how we've been able to stave it off like this. But I think Oklahoma just doesn't want to have a, I guess the people there, they don't want to have a problem like some of the northern states do where they got 30 40 percent of their deer that are cwd positive and they're they're taking this action preemptively to attempt to restock deer that are more durable to prevent that from happening mm -hmm. yeah yeah um, makes sense yeah no i mean i i think it definitely does um you know, I, th I think when you kind of look at the, the bigger picture here and, and again, you know, unfortunately, the, the politics of things often suppress science um, just because that's, you know, it's always easy to manage wildlife. It's not easy to manage the people aspect of it. When you get into these kind of discussions, I guess, uh, I mean, has anybody has anybody looked at these deer that um, are less susceptible to CWD? And obviously they still can get it. But, you know. Uh, are, are they are they truly living longer lives at that point? Uh, the deal, the deer that are less susceptible to the disease when they get it. So there's there's some misconceptions out there, and this is part of the propaganda. People will say, "Oh, well, you know, they're just all you're doing is making them live longer with the disease," and mm -hmm. and that that's a problem because they're just going to shed more. Well, you know, that doesn't even that doesn't really makes sense with some of the established literature because we know that the deer that that are most susceptible they rapidly misfold and amplify the agent much more efficiently than the ones that are more resistant and mm -hmm. so their ability to shed um it, uh, quantitatively much larger amounts of the agent is is established in the literature with transgenic mice you know other things and so you know, the, this idea that, you know, that none of them are really resistant and that, <clears throat> you know, you're just prolonging the problem is, is, a, is a lie. I mean, the, the scrapey resistant sheep that are so magically resistant, they can still get scrapey. It just doesn't happen very often. Right. Right. And so if you can reduce the incidence of disease by, you know, 80 to 90 something percent, then, you're also going to prevent loading up your production environment mm -hmm. um, because you can't shed what you don't amplify. Right. right? It, you just can't, it, it just doesn't work. And so just to reiterate, you can ask a very simple question, which is 
if you look at the deer that have the best genetics based on all of the studies that we've done, and you say, okay, if we look at all CWD positive deer that have occurred at 30 different positive facilities, how many of those positives have the good recipe for genetics, right? Mm -hmm. And the answer is about half of 1% of all the positives, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. And then if you go and you look at where did they come from, what pens were they in, when that information, you know, is available, what happens is that what you find is that those ones that did get positive with the better genetics, because it's a spectrum of better genetics, the ones that did get did get positive come from high prevalence facilities where they're getting huge daily doses of exposure. Right. And if that wasn't going on there, you wouldn't be having a problem. Yeah. So we also see deer at these facilities that at the time of depopulation were 12, 13, 14 years old. And so they were there before the initial exposure event and they were there all the way to the end. <laughs> and some of those herds got caught up in litigation. So it was years and years reached high prevalence. And then when they, when they're depopulated and 13, 14 years old have stellar genetics and they're non-detect everywhere you look, you see an overt, profound evidence that there is a high level of genetic resistance and a lot of genetic improvement that can be made in relation to CWD. Mm. And the numbers, if you look at the numbers and align them with aspects of, of sheep, they look nearly identical mm. in that manner. Interesting. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I hope if anything, people listening to this have some more of the science foundation to be able to make their own judgment on. And and the hard thing is, is we hear about CWD management so often from DNRs and, and a, you know, just daily deer hunting type stuff. And to, to your point earlier, a lot of it is surveillance, you know, and, and I think we're finally to the point, you know, a decade plus into this thing from like it being an issue of like, what's being done. And we, we don't know. You know, that it's like, what, well, it's pretty clear that we don't know. I we mean, we, we've had a lot of conversations with a lot of people who, you know, and, should know or should, you know, would know. And they're like, well, we don't. And <laughs> you know? millions and, and millions, and words, and millions of dollars being spent on it. And to the point of the peer reviewed stuff, you know, Dr. Seabury, I mean, a lot of this stuff we're discussing today from your side is in peer reviewed articles, like flip the script and look at like any of the management techniques for CWD in peer reviewed. And there's not a lot there that's giving valid answers or like explanations of like, here's what's happening. Here's well, the the what we only, only one we, that I know of is, is herd reduction. And the question that we right. have is, is there any evidence that that's working? Well, people don't tend to publish negative data. Exactly. So if, they, <laughs> if they take some management level, you know, like when they, when they tried to, um, um, when they, when they tried to use sharpshooters to, completely eradicate deer from certain areas in hopes that they would eradicate the disease. Um, and then deer from elsewhere moved into that area in the future and reproduced and took it over as a, as a working habitat and home range. And then eventually they, you know, they started to get the disease as mm -hmm. well because it's present in the environment. Nobody published a paper about that in peer review. I mean, we found out about it through various, you know, reporting, but that's not something that people, you know, peer review, but you can play numbers games where you go in and reduce the density of deer very drastically, get a temporary reduction in the prevalence of the disease. But as soon as you let the density creep back up, the prevalence will creep back up if the agent is present in the environment, sufficiently present, then, you know, that'll happen. So you're just sort of hmm. playing a, a, a numbers game, if you will. Doesn't it also seem, I mean, I guess you're saying uh, of the samples that you took, it was less than half of 1%. So maybe that answers my question here. But to the sharpshooting or herd reduction tactic, uh, before I knew that statistic, I was like, well, if there's deer that are naturally uh, uh, less likely to get it, you know, th those might be, you know, the answer, right? And we're, we're killing them potentially. Yeah, that's exactly right because that process is totally indiscriminate. So you can, yeah, you know, you you you're 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 killing some of your deer that have 
more durable genetics and you don't even know it. Mm-hmm. It'd be like shooting. There, there's a lot of problems with all things. Yeah, it'd be yeah, like shooting all your those types of management. Sorry, go ahead. <clears throat> there's problems with uh, with that type of management practice, exactly for the reason that you said it. Mm-hmm. it it's totally indiscriminate to the individual animal, and you 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 can be wiping out. Uh, even some of mother nature's work with some of the better and more durable deer. Right. Yeah. Hmm. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, boy, I don't know. Like it, I'd love to hear, and maybe it will happen after having had this conversation, why there's such strong opposition to it. I mean, I can understand that in some ways relate to the, the, the purest uh, opposition, but also like I want to have deer to hunt. Mm-hmm. And so, and I look at like you're saying in the aquaculture situation, like with fish, I'm like, you stock the crap out of fish, you know, mm-hmm. and it's great. Everybody's happy. Also have hybrids of species and hybrid. We've got all kind of cool yeah. stuff, you know, they fight, you know, they fight and game birds. Yeah. Same, same game, game birds. birds. Yep. So same way. Yeah. I, I want to say that I'm, I'm pretty open-minded to it. You know what I mean? I think it ties and back. Wolves. Yeah, exactly. I think it ties back to, if we think about it from a deer standpoint, it's, it's the reintroduction and restocking efforts. I mean, the reason that many states have the herd that we have now is because of reintroduction and restocking. Yeah. And, and to so, have that purity standpoint, you almost have to deny that in some ways. Well, I think where it goes back to is it's the, it's the, it's probably the stereotype around deer farming. And to your point earlier, sure. just, you know, 250 inch two year old deer walking sure. around and, and that, that thinking of introduction into the wild populations, not fair to the to the mm-hmm. purest side of things. Um, obviously, to Doctor Seabury's point, there's a lot of environmental and external factors that are going to limit that expression, even sure. if the genes exist, even if they exist in the wild population. And that's true. Mm-hmm. Um, so that that still may be you know a, a point of contention. I yeah. could see that, but uh, from any other argument of why not to potentially introduce deer that have you know a better suited genetic makeup to to resist this disease i don't see why not Mm. well you know i i i my goal is to leave it up to the states let them decide what they want i'm happy to explain the science i'm happy to implement the science but i don't go around trying to sell the science to all the states as a Uh, some sort of captive propagation solution. I'm just Mm -hmm. not going to do that. But, you know, what I would say is that you could do something like this in a more, you know, quote, pure way, but it would be far less efficient. For example, if you knew where some wild deer were that, that were much more durable, you could erect a high fence and catch them in the high fence, allow them to naturally breed, you could capture and mark the fawns with mm-hmm. purple ear tags. You could eventually turn them out from that facility. And, you know, those would be more pure. Right. And they'd be more wild. But the efficiency of that approach would, yeah. would be poor. Right. And, you know, even if you put out, um, even if you put out bred does from a captive facility, you know, they're going to fawn out based on this, buck that they were bred to right but after that they're going to be breeding with the native deer that are there and so you're not going to have these two-year-old monstrosities walking around i mean if that's your real fear i don't think that i, I wouldn't expect that to happen you yeah, know yeah i tend to agree with you yeah i'm, I'm convinced yeah yeah, I mean, I do think it is. I mean, you think about how much money's been poured into CWD surveillance and and other aspects to this point. You know, even though it may not be the most efficient way, I mean, why wouldn't a state have its own facility if if they're worried about the captive industry side of things yeah. to have those? You know, basically be doing tests and and breeding and selective. It's going to take time and years, but I mean, that seems like maybe if they a better- did that. If they did that on a state level, it would be so inefficient and cost so much money. I yeah. fear that they would say that it didn't work because they, yeah. I mean, there's a, you know, there's a big difference between putting out 500 or a thousand bread doughs per year mm-hmm. and whatever you can do 
in a facility like I just described. And the way I described it was to illustrate the inefficiency mm-hmm. of, of that process. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I mean, even if you had a high fence, I mean, first of all, I've tested wild deer all over the state of Texas. And there are a few places where the genetics are a little bit enhanced, but man, it would be really hard for me to do what I just told you mm-hmm. with any efficiency over there. Yeah. It would cost a lot having to, you know, capture the fawns, genetically test them, maybe recapture and mark them. Yeah. It's a lot you of know, stress it, on that it, animal. It, yeah. that That's just not, it, 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 it's not very practical. So, um, you know, like I said, the science is pretty clear that all deer are not created equal in terms of resistance to CWD. Some are much, much more resistant. If people want to use that science and that technology, then we we try to help them use that in a way that is responsible mm-hmm. and defendable. But I'm not going to go around to every state and beat a drum about, you know, captive restocking. I want it to be the will of the people. And yeah, that's yeah. what you saw in Oklahoma. I think it's great information. I mean, it even is. just the third party kind of misconceptions we've heard leading into this of like single gene stuff and like, you know, they're still going to get it. They're still going to die. And like you coming around on that. Well, I mean, it's just, it's interesting information <laughs> to have on that side of things. Um, if it's got a link into, you know, the EHD or blue tongue side of things, um, yeah. you know, becomes more there. You know, I still see why people are, that, are resistant that's a big to one. it. I, I, I'm, I know we're over your time here, so I, I don't want to open the can of worms. But, I mean, the basic question is, like, can you, uh, just for a minute here, can is there a similar fix for EHD? Can you say, hey, we could identify the alleles, we have the testing for it, you know, we could, so we we, could issue we a were gonna We were going to do a very extensive EHD study using our R&D technology mm-hmm. and you know, you have to have proper diagnostics because EHD gets blamed for a lot of dead loss, no matter what really caused it. Right. Right. So mm. you, you can't just anecdotally say EHD, you know, you have to actually prove that that's what um, caused the mortality. And that requires diagnostics and many times posting the deer necropsy, so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. Unless they have prototypical signs and then you can run the proper diagnostics. However, what, what I started noticing was that deer, that had the best genetic recipe for CWD were the ones that were still alive at farms following an EHD outbreak Mm -hmm. or a Mm -hmm. blue tongue outbreak. They're just more superior animals overall. Well, it's a correlated trait. It's a longevity correlated trait. And I could get down in the weeds and explain it more, but it's not that I don't think that it's not the same trait. It's that the genetics that afford resistance to CWD, there's some overlap with yep. with resistance to other diseases Makes and sense. general longevity. And one of the things that I, I think we got cut off by the by the internet, we were talking about this single gene thing. You just brought it up. Mm-hmm. We were talking about how just the inappropriate nature of genetic engineering and knocking the gene out and all the problems with that. Well, you know, even though knocking the gene out would prevent misfolding of the prion protein. Um, the other way that people, they, when they hear that, they can't understand why isn't it a single gene then? Well, why it's not a single gene is that if the prion protein gene is present and functional and making prion protein in the body of a mammal, That protein is not an island. It doesn't exist by itself. It will interact with other proteins. It will be present in multiple pathways. And so all the genes that are contributing to that pathway and all of their natural genetic variation, right, and all the proteins that the prion interacts with and the genes that encode those proteins and all their natural genetic variation, that, that is part of this polygenic nature of the trait. The protein is not existing on its own, Mm -hmm. okay? And it's present in multiple pathways. So when it is present in its normal capacity and doing something normal, you know, it it becomes a polygenic trait. 
And so people, they just have trouble understanding that CWD resistance <clears throat> or susceptibility is not a simple dominant or recessive single gene trait. Right. They have a lot of trouble with that. Yeah. No, I think they do. I think that that's, that's a big piece of it. Um, yeah, they have a tough time understanding the disease in general, but I think it's just because you hear so much different stuff flying around out there and it's like, at this point, you don't know what's true, mm -hmm. you know, or what's being done. And depending on what state you're in, you know, you've either been in this fairly recent, you know, or you've been completely swamped with it for a decade now. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's an interesting thing, but I mean, the genetic makeup levels is the foundation in it to understand. I mean, I want people to do what they're comfortable with, but I do take issue with people trying to scare the public about CWD and people trying to use propaganda um, in place of real science. Uh, that does bother me. But, you know, people in various states just have to decide for themselves how big of a problem this really is, and that will determine what they want to do about it. They can mm -hmm. just keep doing what they've been doing and spending all the money they're spending and get the same result that they have, or they can try new things, um, new and novel things, or um, they can just leave it up to Mother Nature and live with it as it is. But yeah. it has to be the will of the people, I think. Is there a good resource for people beyond this podcast that want to learn about CWD or uh, is there a good resource that people can, can, can go to to read up onto it or listen to lectures or anything like that? Mm, well, you know, Feel free we, to do, try to give, too, we you... do try to give educational talks and podcasts as often as we can, but I do not know of any singular educational resource where people can go to get information about all of the most um, recent modern cutting edge research and and things that are not implicitly biased i mean because there's extremists on both sides right sure. mm -hmm. i mean there's there's people that are extremist breeders and there's people that are extremist conservation people mm -hmm. And I would say you don't want to be sourcing your information from either. Either. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It well, seems to be the problem right there. There's not yeah. even a good source. Well, that I appreciate can go your to, so. approach to this conversation has been yeah. very, you know, factual and scientific based. I mean, that's, that's what we need. So mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. I'll be glad to come back anytime. I do. I do um, anticipate having a lot of um, new, uh, developments and discoveries in the future that would probably be things that you and your state would yeah. be interested in. That'd be great. Yeah, yeah we'll be, very much so. We'd be yeah. really excited to keep, I mean, I think for us, um, the, the more we can keep our audience up on cutting edge, what's actually happening, what's being done, what are the results? Uh, that's what people want, right? It's, you know, it's great to go back and see what's happened, but it's like, where are we right now and what's being done well, to continue to innovate from the outside looking in, like for, just from the, from everyday hunter perspective, Oklahoma's the first of anything. It's like for a long time, we just said, well, Northern Missouri shoots all the deer and like, nobody likes that. And then it's like years and years and years. And then it's just like, whoa, Oklahoma's doing this. Like what people would say is a really off the wall thing here. And so it's like, it's the first major development. Yeah. Uh, and your name obviously came up quite I think quite a bit as as far as the uh, the science the, uh, the the scientific backing for that. So that's that's why we reached out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I'm glad. I'm I'm happy to to visit. And like I said, I I do anticipate you know new peer reviewed publications in the not so distant future that would be things that I think your audience would be interested in. So I'd be excellent happy to come back. Cool. Yeah. And I'm sure you'll think of some more. Oh, I'm sure. Some more questions. Yeah, um, I know we went double over your time here, so I apologize for that too. Yeah. No, no problem. Well, we Thank appreciate you. it. Thanks, Dr. C. C. Barry. We really appreciate it. Yep, I do too. Thank you. The Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Sever. Well, one of the biggest things that we always talk about is what our arrow setups are. And this year we're shooting the Sever broadheads. I think we're both shooting the new two inch titanium broadhead. And so, you know, we're huge proponents of expandables. And I know we've had this argument back and forth with people, but 
we just we're, we're right and you're wrong and that's you just need to accept it. we just want to have a giant wound <laughs> that pumps out blood that's the bottom line we build our arrow setups and shoot bows you know f- to maximize penetration and we shoot broadheads that are gonna give us the best blood trails you know the most hemorrhage possible uh, and so part of those setups is we're also shooting the eastern arrows here coming up pretty soon so we've, yep. sh- we've shot the victory in the past mm-hmm. and you know there's all kind of great arrow shafts on the market but like we're looking for a whole system from broadhead to arrow components to the arrow shaft itself and uh, you know the more we look at some of these eastern shafts and the components that go with them that setup's going to be really deadly for us yeah i'm actually using the eastern traditional axis right now uh in my traditional setups for both my recurve and my longbow i've got a hundred grain brass insert on those and then obviously i'm using a fixed blade broadhead on on those specific shafts right on so, but yeah, our goal is always to be shooting the best broadhead that we think is going to be the most lethal for our setups. We've done plenty of research. We believe in the Sever broadheads, and we hope you would check them out at Sever Broadheads as well. Cool. Yeah, I mean, uh, different than I thought in a good way. Like I, and again, it's, you never know. I mean, the reason we have guys like that on here is like, we want to get to know them, you know, and see, see what they're like when they get involved. I, from everything I had heard from just various people and, and obviously my connection is mainly to the conservationists. Like if he talks about the people at the end, the people I know are the conservationists, not so much to the deer farming community. When you say conservationist. It's like your NDAs and, uh, okay. you know, can you admit, your DNR people. Those are all conservationists. Okay. Right. So they're on that side of the CWD spectrum. Most of them. Uh, in, what, in what way? They're basically like uh, legislative, like. No, they're state, state purist. They're the purist side. Right versus the deer farming side; those are the two ends of the. Yeah, spectrum. yeah, but but why? They're they're advocating for the yeah. resource, right? For for wildlife, just because for of the North, hunter opportunity. North American model of conservation. I mean, I mean, who are who are the biggest? Uh, so NDA, you mentioned like yep. not in the whitetail space, but like RMEF would be yep. uh, similar. Yep, ducks and Unlip- Ducks Unlimited, who, NWTF. Who, who else is heavy in like the whitetail space as far as like... Uh, it's really the DNRs. I don't like to name names, but just the who, DNRs, who are the DNRs, the game groups? commissions and stuff. Those okay. are your conservationists. Okay. Yeah. I mean, those are the main conservationists. Right. NDA is kind of an overarching, you mm-hmm. know, lo- like you a know, national lobbyist group. association. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyways, uh, my perceived, what I expected from, from Dr. Seabury was him to be on the side of the deer farmers. Mm-hmm. Uh, very much, maybe not to the extreme end that, that a lot of them are, but, you know, leaning heavy that way of like, you know, the, the, the pushing that, I yeah, guess. I didn't hear any of that. No, I mean, very much saying like, I don't want to be the guy that keeps bringing up restocking. I want to be the guy that says, hey, here's the genetic science of it. Dude, love science. You know, and whether, <laughs> you know, however you want. Yes, from an efficiency standpoint, and he did say it from an efficiency standpoint. Sure. Releasing those deer from a ca- current captive facility is the most efficient that's a fact. way it would be of course um volume wise i don't know right because like that's when things get and this is where you know fortunately unfortunately he stayed out of kind of the oklahoma thing and i haven't read that bill completely um it, there, there's a lot of intricacies then taking his research and applying it sure for instance number one would be where do these captive deer come from right are they coming from facilities within the state and that would be not necessarily because of like the genetics, but like from an economic standpoint, like why not keep those economics within the state? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, is there a from an oversight standpoint? You got to wonder who felt confident. That's like, okay, here's the science. Got it. All right, we're good. For, we're good it from was here. Lobbied very hard. Probably, I, I don't know from who. Like maybe some of the the high end deer management stuff. Because here's the thing about Oklahoma and Texas, especially, is there's a lot of high fence private ranches in mm-hmm. those states. Mm-hmm. A lot of them. Mm. As you get more towards the Midwest and Northeast, n- not nearly as prevalent. Uh, also, uh, Oklahoma is better, but Texas is like 98 percent private. There is no public land really, besides I think like some East Texas areas. Mm-hmm. Um, Texas guys can correct me, but it, it's not a lot. There is more pro- uh, public land in Oklahoma, still not a ton. So like I know, guy killed a giant on Texas public last year. Yeah, so yeah, me you. too. Yeah. yeah, not a lot of it. Um, so you know who you are? Yeah, you know, you know. Who you are. <laughs> so you know, if you look at those kind of applications of it, it's like okay, well, if you're applying this to 
the King Ranch in Texas. Well, yeah, it's hundreds of thousands of acres of of private land. Like, there what, di- what difference does it make if it's private or public? Well, it gets back to that public resource standpoint. It's like, well, if and, it, in terms of stakeholders, in terms of the stakeholders, sure. because if it's if it's hundreds of thousands of acres of private landowner, like, yes, it's a public resource, but it's on a giant piece of private ground that no public is going to access. Sure. Yeah. So it's more complicated. Yep. So, you know, the more public you have. Right. So, te- so Oklahoma becomes more complicated than this if this happens in Texas, right? Cause there is more public ground in Oklahoma than there is in Texas. So, you know, that's where I think, where do these deer come from? You're going to need a lot of them to make I a, mean, I mean, do you think geographically, like if 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 that trend is gonna continue, mm-hmm. especially if EHD becomes a a component or a factor where they're like, Huge. hey, listen, we can we yep. can restock deer. Yeah, uh, I would say to be resistant to both of these. I mean, does it go to Kansas next? The majority of states are going to be very resistant because of the the purest conservation mindset. Well, yeah, but at a certain point, it's like you got to make some decisions if if cwd is an issue i don't i don't know that man. seems like still like in question like even he's it's like an issue no no he knows it's an issue mm-hmm. i mean the, the whole reason is like these deer that are very susceptible to it die they die 100 percent of the time right there is no survival with with cwd even the even the deer that are less susceptible to it if they get cwd they don't recover from it they yeah. die well just not from CWD yeah, though, yeah. right? But right. From, but, well, from and here's else. here's just like a statement for, uh, t- you know, to exploit like the ambiguity of it. It's just mm-hmm. like all deer die, all just deer period. Die? All humans die. All Everybody animals dies die. eventually. So all like, animals with die. no condition whatsoever. Correct. So what we're trying to assess is what is the level of threat and what is the time frame that they die? Because mm-hmm. if the, if it let's say you get CWD, a deer gets CWD and it takes 10 years to kill it. Well, shit, most deer don't live to 10 years. Right. Right. So it's a mute point. Right. Um, if it's 18 months, right, then it becomes, it's, to, a, it's affecting, you know, the, which is what most say, most say it's that around that 18 <clears throat> month time frame. I don't know about the difference between the more susceptible, less susceptible deer, mm-hmm. but from most of the research that's proven out there, if they get CWD 18 months till death, something kills them in 18 months. Hmm. Well, I mean, it could be a vehicle, could be a hunter, could could be a disease like pneumonia who's, or And something. who's saying that? Uh, that's just peer published review research that's been out there for yeah. a while yeah. now. Because I guess his statement towards that was fairly vague too. It was just kind of like, Show me the carcass pile. Show me the deer. Show me the state where they're all dying. Well, and it's not that they're dying. Yeah. So in those cases, it's because they have the deer in captivity. Here's a deer in captivity, has CWD. 18 months later, give or take, it dies. Okay. Versus the wild side of things. Because sure. I don't know how that's... Um, yeah. I Most most of the monitoring that's being done is uh, hunter harvested or roadkill deer. deer. Mm-hmm. Right. Those so those deer are dead from one of those two reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say it's an overwhelming amount. Ninety nine percent of the surveillance happens from a roadkill deer or a hunter harvested deer. Okay. Um, they're not walking through the woods and finding a deer and testing it type of thing. Right. I'm sure there there have been a handful of calls where a deer looks sickly and mm-hmm. whatever DNR Game Commission comes out, kills it, tests it, maybe it tests positive. Sure. I don't know, but that's. A small small amount um the the things that i think are still up in the air from a state level is again where do those deer come from what are they what are what are those lines of deer like i don't think anybody listening to this would be for people like uh having does with like superior superior genetics from an antler size being put out in the wild I don't think any of us want that. Well, but it's, yeah, but when it's just phrased that way, <clears throat> yeah, what, why? Why mess with it? But if the reason is because it's going to address an illness that could kill. Well, yeah. You I, know what I mean? It's but like, I, well. I guess what I'm saying is can we have those um, resistant deer that don't have, that weren't bred for just superior antlers? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and. I thought he had a fair point about, he's like, well, you know, and I don't know. I don't know if there's any sorting out of like, hey, we want to try to 
choose, you know, uh, you know, farms or what that, that are, uh, basically, you know, you, whatever the, the strains are not CWD mm-hmm. breeding facilities that are not part of the antler breeding right, right. side of things. Yeah. And I'm sure, I'm and sure, I don't know. I'm sure you can. Yeah. I mean, there's, it's probably a life cycle of like, uh, mm-hmm how far along are you in your selection process you know some some, some are very far some are some very are far along hey maybe you should be excluded like no offense <laughs> you know yeah you know we, we want deer that are not as long in their select not as far along in their selection process for antler genetics because mm-hmm. that's the domino effect right because let's say all of a sudden hypothetically a thousand bread does are released in this area of oklahoma yeah. five years <clears> from now uh, it's nothing to kill a 200 yeah. inch deer. And I don't know, but his, so his follow up point there was like, Hey, they also need, uh, n- nutrition is a, oh, yeah. a major component of that. Yeah. I, that, I'm very curious how big of a component it's giant. like literally it's giant. Yeah. I mean, without nutrition or, and from our conversation with Aaron too, yeah. talking about like generational expression of the genes, um, we or, did the or even like a life not just a lifetime, literally generational feeding programs and stuff. It's like if you had the deer with those genetics, with the age class, without the nutrition, they wouldn't be able what, to express it. What would they be? We don't know. I mean, that's yeah. the thing. Like, if it, if it has the potential to be a 250, it still could be a 190. Like, it's very possible. Yeah, but there's 190s out there. Sure, but they're not common. No. But what if they become common? Right. That's the qu- that that's what comes yeah, into question. I don't know if they do. I mean, it, it's a huge. It's no. It's not bigger than age, right? Like, I mean, there there are very few two hundred inch two year olds walking out there. I mean, wh- how much how much would you be okay with? I, I don't know. I mean, like, that, if there was a couple more one nineties, would I be okay with that? Like, I don't. Maybe I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it, it <laughs> it's a really dicey area. Yeah, be, because like, if all of a sudden, I mean, we've had this conversation just with you know society in general like big big bucks aren't that cool anymore they're just everywhere other st- i mean they're so cool to me but yeah yeah but i know what you're saying but yeah i mean you don't get as worked up if you see a 150 anymore uh yeah but yeah you don't because you see them all over the place i'm not saying you yeah. personally or you ca- they're just they're everywhere there's pictures of them everywhere uh well pictures yeah i would say that that feeling comes more from trail cameras in general sure uh, than, well than social media i mean yeah you see them on social media but just yeah that feeling they're comes just from not as just, special anymore well they are but you're just you're more acquainted to them you're you're, more, you're just more used to seeing them our guest tomorrow will be interested in talk about because i think his dad was involved back in the day like mm-hmm. in the 90s there was a, something called the 900 club mm-hmm. which was your top six bow bucks totaling 900 inches that's like 150 inch average and that was a big ass deal back then. Okay, that's it's, a big deal. It, it's not a big deal anymore. No, I'm in the nine hundred club. club, and that's no, not, you're not. Yeah, I am. You've done the math. My top six bucks are over nine hundred. I thought you bow. had to kill nine. No, no, no. Top six bucks over nine hundred inches. Hmm, that's a hundred and fifty inch average. I wonder if I'm in the club. Do you get something? Huh? Not anymore. <laughs> you're, said you're, you're, or you're a piece of shit now. <laughs> but hmm. you, you see what I'm saying is like. In 1990, I think it was 92, the article was put out. In 1992, I'd there were like there were like a hand, a couple handfuls of guys. Like they were the yeah. they were the dudes. Yeah. Everybody's the dude now. Oh uh, yeah. Not so right. you, well, see you just got to yeah, raise the bar. I mean. Well, so okay. So the bar's been raised because of our management tactics, our information, everything about it were more lethal. So what what would be um what would be what was six n- uh, and I guess it would go off of like a net scoring system too, technically. Yeah. Uh, yeah, probably. You got like your 900 netters and your 900 grocers. Yeah. So like right 170 now. 170 gross is a boner to me. Well, so now I would say that probably is approaching six bucks at 170. Which is? Um, See if you can beat the machine here. Get the uh, computer. Uh, nine. No. A thousand twenty. A thousand twenty. Amazing. Yes! You beat me by a second. Yes. That's impressive, dude. So a thousand twenty, right? A thousand twenty club. That's that would be that'd be six, six booners, six booners with a bow. Yeah, I'm not in that club. Yeah, me either. So you know, so they're okay now. Bars raised, and so that I think what you call it the rising club. Yeah, right. <laughs> I think that the uh, the purest thing, the the two things I'll take from that is or three, I guess. Number one, where we already said, I'm glad he didn't lean one way or the other. I thought that was really because that's. That is yeah. the, the misconception it's I had coming state. in. Mm-hmm. That was great. He, he just said, here's the science. They can make their decision. Mm-hmm. Uh, number two, and I guess failing to realize it, 
He's the first one who said Mother Nature will outpace CWD. Mm -hmm. You may not have those four, five, and six-year-old bucks, but the breeding and the reproduction will outpace death of CWD yep. from CWD. That's a big deal. You know, you know that immediately I mean? eliminates if it's true, which I mean makes sense. If it's true, it immediately eliminates everybody on this side who said in 20 or 30 years, if we do nothing, deer are dead. Mm -hmm. They're gone. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, it would. Yeah. Yes. Right? Yeah. 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 It's, it, uh, That's a, to me, that was a giant point that was made. Well, and the follow up point where I, my mind can't help but go, but is do people care at that point about deer hunting? We've had that conversation about deer. I, in period. Because you'd have to go backwards. You'd have to go backwards. In what way? What do you mean? You, I mean, there, there are no four and five year olds to kill. You'd have to kill two and three year olds. Yep. And I think at that point, people don't care about it enough. I think it changes hunting dramatically, but I do think that that I, I it may not be our generation. We may be dead, but I think in future generations, they go back to hunting as a camaraderie or sustenance side of things. I think all of your property values go down. I, dude, I'm telling you, it's a giant domino effect. But I do think that there's a generation that comes back because you're not going to not hunt. People will hunt, but they'll do it for a completely different reason than our generation. I don't know, man. I could see people giving it up. They can't because if they do, then it goes, it turns over to the state to manage the herd. Mm -hmm. They won't do it. It's mm -hmm. too much money. I don't know. We're free labor and they make money off of us, frankly. We, we pay them to kill them. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I think it would change. I mean, uh, you know, uh, I don't know. It'd be a completely different feeling. But I if, think I think there's enough people out there who don't care about deer that would rather just be like they see them as a nuisance. Mm -hmm. That they're like, well, well, you know, they'll find another way to make the revenue off something else. Um, I think possibly. Yeah, I think without the passion for trophy hunting, frankly, I mean, dude, it's Africa. Like if there wasn't big African, you know, trophy animals to hunt, then all the animals would the be dead. trophy factor in America. And we haven't Maybe. got into that. That I think it's like 5% of the hunters. They pay a lot of money and they own a lot of land and they lease a lot of ground, mm -hmm. but I bet it's 5% of the hunting population. And, and that's just from even me just seeing our own comments on how, our own How stuff. many of those people do you think would hunt with, if there was no chance of shooting a big buck uh, you, of like the current let's say 14 million deer hunters out there right yeah, now that 95 percent that you're talking about i would think most of them most of them what would just go kill a buck because that's what they do anyways mm -hmm. hmm. maybe yeah i would say you know you might lose you I might lose four or five million hunters um but i think the rest of them would still hunt because for a lot of those guys they've never killed a three-year-old so it's still a big deer Sure. Yeah. I mean, I guess it depends where the cutoff is. It's like, yeah. I, and I would too. I'd still hunt three year olds, but like, mm -hmm. I what don't if know. You, what it, I mean, what if five, 10 years from now, like it was hard to kill a four year old? Like that might be the cool thing then to find a four year old. Right. Well, yeah. But it, I mean, when you, when it, when you know what you know, it can't be the cool thing. It just is what it is now. It's like, well, this is what we mm -hmm. have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know. And that sucks. Yeah. You're always, you always want to be looking for more. Yeah. Because yeah. you know it's possible. We know. I know what a six-year-old buck looks like on a hoof. It's like, I'll always yeah. be chasing that. Yeah, and so maybe it's 10 generations. Maybe it's 100 generations. I mean, I don't know. It's deer. like, don't yeah, know. it'd be very hard for me to say, like, wow, I just wouldn't hunt anymore. I don't. It would take a lot for me to, like, just exist. I mean, obviously, because I did that now. I'm like, well, okay, if mm -hmm. three-year-olds are all this possible in this place that we hunt, I'm going to go find older deer. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I don't know. I guess that's that pursuit's happening now, right, mm -hmm. for, for people. So The Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Better Backstrap. But well, one thing that's undeniable, man, is you and I both like to eat. And so we're going to be partnering with the Better Backstrap this year to have the best seasonings possible for, for our meat this summer. Yeah. Well, dude, when it comes to venison, you know, it's like you've heard me talk about before. It's like, what does the preparation for all this look like and stuff? And it's like, I, I really want to make a point of eating more venison moving forward. And some of the Better Backstrap mixtures have made it super easy. Yeah. And so we've got kind of three core mixtures. You've got your original Better Backstrap, which is for that grilling of your backstrap or tenderloins or anything like that. You've got your classic taco mix. Mm, Always can't, go gonna, wrong with can't go wrong with that. And then you've got your standard SPG in the orange can. Well, SPG and down the hatch. There you go. So right now, if you go to betterbackstrap.com, you can use the code HUNTER15, get 15% off any of your orders on the seasonings, and there'll probably be more coming out here throughout the year. Get yourself a better backstrap. What was the third point you were going to get to there? Um, 
It was that. Oh, it was the fact that um, I still think that you're going to have giant roadblocks from most states. Um, and it's because of the North American model for conservation, which is basically the non-privatized model of wildlife. Mm -hmm. This opens that door for the destruction of that, which I... Why? How, how so? Uh, because essentially private privatization is going to now dictate the management of deer in a lot of cases. Um, how, how are they being privatized? No, it's the because they're privatized. Basically, the state's going to have to buy deer from private yep. entities to then essentially manage right. this disease. They don't want to do that. Why not? Uh, just because that goes against what they're... That's why most of these states are like, well, we just want to reduce the herd dramatically because we can do that without having to pay anybody to do that stuff. Just start their own deer pens. They're not going to. Why not? It'll be too cost prohibitive. And just buy them. What's the problem? What, why? What's they the don't problem? Have the money. They, they they pay private contractors and stuff all the time for other like for military purposes or for I mean yeah. But what do you mean? Not from a DNR level. Why not? How, why they is don't have any the different? money. There's few, only a couple agencies in the state, in the United States, that could afford it. Missouri's one of them because of the sales tax they have. They have a, a lot of money. But like the, if the Pennsylvania Game Commission had to buy deer from, they don't have any money. They're broke already. Are they? Yes. Besides their oil and gas money. I mean, yeah, but if it's that or no deer, I mean, or, you know, the, the alternative, which is what we're talking about, I think, I think that they're going to buy them. It can't be that expensive. <laughs> <laughs> I bet it surprised you how much it costs for for does, bread does. Yeah, but it has to be there has to be a market value. Like if, mm -hmm. if they're too if they're unaffordable, then what's mm -hmm. the point of them existing? So to that point, I guess it kind of split with three is like, is there enough facilities to produce these deer? Mm -hmm. Like, are there enough facilities in the state of Oklahoma to produce five thousand bread does a year? I don't know. I, don't know. I have no idea. At a cost effectiveness. Mm -hmm. I have no idea. Yeah, I don't know either. So, because I think the way that it's going right now, and anybody from Oklahoma that knows this better than me, and maybe we'll find somebody to bring on, um, is this law opens up private ranches the ability to buy and place deer. Not, the state's not buying anything. The state's not doing anything. It's just allowing, if you own a thousand acres, you can go out and buy deer and put them on your property. Okay. That's all that's doing. Now, where I don't know is what's the regulation there. Cause like some of these guys might not give two shits about CWD and they're like, cool, I'm going to go buy 10 giant ass bucks and bread does and put them on my property. And I'm going to have 280 inch deer on my property. Right. That's bad. That, that has to, I hope that loopholes closed. You would think there'd be some accounting for it. Yeah. Unless it's a high fence of which I don't give a shit. Yeah. But from a low fence, free ranging standpoint, like that will, that affects the public resource. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a, that, you know, foundationally, which I kind of got from, from Chris is like foundationally, there's a lot of really good information out there, but it, it just like anything, people can fuck it up, <laughs> right? Like they could take his science and open the gate to stuff that wouldn't be good per se. What we just said, like somebody who doesn't care about CWD, but now this allows them to buy a bunch of 280 inch bucks to release on their free range property. Mm -hmm. That's not the point of his <clears throat> research. Well, I mean, he would argue that, uh, and, and Brian from Quest said the same thing. He's like, the bucks are, you know, not as, uh, don't have as much uh, effect on the antler size as the does. They both said the same thing. They f the, the, to a point. That's, like, that's literally what he just said there. He's like, if you wanted to do that, you would, it would be the does and you'd release the does. I mean, still from a genetic makeup, I, I mean, I don't see how you can go away from it being potentially 50-50. The, the factor from the does becomes around the does nutrition to then pass to the fawn during weaning and like it's first antler size. Like all of those things can restrict I mean, that maybe deer. it's anecdotal. I, I don't have like a study to point to, but both those guys are implying that there's evidence to support that the does control more of the antler size than the bucks. Genetically? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know that. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I'm pretty, yeah. Yeah. Um, so that'd be the way to do it. But... And then on top of that, it's like you still don't have that nutrition element. It's like, yeah, you can feed on your, your mm -hmm. low fence farm, but yeah, like, you're not. It's not going to be as controlled of a setting. No way. But I still think those deer are line bred out enough that you'll yeah, produce. It doesn't have like it's going it doesn't out of have style. no effect. Yeah, I don't know. I, 
there's no doubt in my mind. Again, if, if you give them the age, right, maybe they don't hit 200 inches at three years old like they are in a pen, but at four mm-hmm. or five, I bet they're crushing it mm-hmm. all over. Yeah, I don't, I, I mean, nutrition is definitely an issue, but the, the, I mean, I don't know. Like, why do, why do we care? Like, if, if you reach a certain point where it's like, hey, all six year olds are 200 inches, then mm-hmm. okay. Yep. That's what they are. So I think it goes, there's the still, there's still going to be bigger ones and smaller ones. Like, I think it goes the same direction of like the thing of you just saying, well, I don't want to kill three year olds. Well, why not? Well, because I've achieved, you know, chasing a five year old and I know what that means. Well, that's because that deer's special. If well, all the deer yeah, at that age were the same, they wouldn't be special. It's it's what we're talking well, about. Well, but right there's now. a difference in antler size and uh and deer ma- and maturity. Mm-hmm. You know, the reason that we're uh that hunt, you know hunting a mature animal is like so special. Like, yes, it has big horns, and that's mm-hmm. that's really that's a big trophy element of it. That's a, that's an exciting thing to see or whatever. Mm-hmm. That's how we quantify it. Mm-hmm. In addition to age, mm-hmm. but they also have, uh, you know, th- their characteristics are way different. Like, th- they're all to me, they're all like the same deer. Like, all two year olds mm-hmm. do the same thing. All three year olds mm-hmm. do the same thing. At four, they start to like you know i mean they all have a personality i don't mean to take away from younger deer in that way but mm-hmm. like they really are emphasized and when a deer becomes the do- a dominant animal like in a mature age class in an area mm-hmm. i think that's what gets expressed and yeah. that, that's why we obsess over hunting them is because of the mannerisms that they have as well as the antlers that they carry well i think also is the frequency that they appear like if sure if we saw if every property we hunted had 15 six-year-olds like they wouldn't be special no no, it's, well, we wouldn't be hunting them. It's well, that, I, we might. I don't know. We'd be hunting the oldest ones that we could. Yeah. Well, I think, you'd, again, you'd find yourself in that, like, it just isn't. That's the challenge. None of what there. we're talking about here changes age structure, though, which is cool. No. So, well, st- it does, because, I mean, if you if you populate a herd with the more the deer that are less susceptible, then the age structure should stay high versus these herds that are being more susceptible yeah. the age structure is going to naturally get lower yeah that goes back to like how much is cwd how how frequently is it killing them versus mm-hmm. hunter kill or yeah, natural i don't yeah. know if we've seen it, it these are the things like from a research standpoint one of these herds has to have had data that says has the age structure first of all has the population decreased mm-hmm. like is are there deer dying is the population decreasing number two would be is the age structure decreasing like are there less older bucks in the population because cwd is super prevalent Mm -hmm. um those would be big things to know right out of the gate Mm -hmm. um i mean it's hard for me to believe that that data doesn't exist he's right though most don't want to put put a peer publish uh paper out that has negative results Mm -hmm. Uh, especially against something that, you know, like this. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. I mean, those are the things that are happening out there that you kind of just, it's the frustration part of a hunting standpoint when you're like, all of this research has been done. And yet like how, to his point, how is there not a neutral site? Like, so chronic wasting disease Alliance, I think is what it is, is a site that you can go and find a bunch of CWD information. I think it's probably leaning more to the uh, conservationist than it is the farming. Like, it's not a neutral site, I guess is what I'm saying. Sure. But it has a ton of really good research, and, yeah, it's, like and the, it's a good— It's like the World Health Organization. Yeah, there's there's good information on there. Um, you know, but it's not going to mention anything that Seabury's doing. Yeah, it's going to be like, that. wear a mask. <laughs> yeah, it's going to—here's—well, and I don't—again, I don't even know from that standpoint what, like, what the results are, like, what— if you have mass shooting in Northern Illinois or Northern Missouri, like what's, what happened? What's the results uh, to Chris's point? I'm sure it's, you know, they took the deer herd down more deer sponged in cause the habitat was better. The disease exists in the environment. They got the disease. They die. Yeah. No effect. No yeah. effect. Waste of time, waste of money. I don't know. I mean, yeah. Yeah. So I, I think there could be, you know, if you do it right, Based on what his information, if you did it right and said, okay, we can release, we did it before. We restocked these places before. I do think that most of that restocking was from wild populations. They took wild deer from Texas. They put them in Mississippi, right? They took wild deer from Oklahoma. They put them in Mississippi. Not. What is the difference? I mean, really? It's this, it's this 
and again, how long not did, to did sound it have to like be the in the purist. fence to be like? Well, it's it, but it's been these deer are, are line gened out. It's like a racehorse, right? Like you're not just going to pull any thoroughbred out and just put them in the Kentucky Derby. Like these deer are bred out. That's why they sell for millions of dollars at one year old. It's the same with a uh, an antler deer in a captive facility. Like some of these one year old deer are selling for a million dollars because of their line of genes, what they can produce, what they then can take and artificially inseminate from. So it's that thought process versus the randomization of a wild herd, which is, you know, there's a chance that this deer has 200 inch genetics because buck a and doe B both had them and Doe B one Kenobi B one. <laughs> and they bred and they created this 200 inch, you know, potential yeah. buck uh -huh. that mystery is taken away when you're talking about the sure. captive Selection. facility because mm -hmm. they've selected for right, it. Right, yeah. Right. It's just like, you know, if you want to buy an AKC dog, that deer, that dog's been selected based on its bloodline to be a purebred. Yeah. So I think that is the, that's the final resistance. They can't use the, I would assume, because these should all be like, you know, CWD monitored facilities. They can't use the, well, we can't release them because you're going to transport, di you know, diseases. That, that should be a mute point, right? Because like all of these deer should have been somewhat tested in a captive facility before they're released. I think the main objection to from like a from a landowner like from from a hunter from mm -hmm. a like a stakeholder in a state standpoint would just be lack of evidence that CWD is killing deer. Like if if they said, mm -hmm. "Hey, this is legal in Ohio. Mm -hmm. You're good to go." Mm -hmm. And I owning a farm, mm -hmm. investing into the deer there would have the right to go and and purchase deer that were CWD selective. Uh I would be like, well, why? Mm -hmm. What what casualty am I experiencing to want to? Sure. And I almost wonder in Oklahoma, like, what were they experiencing that they're like? It's not that not prevalent, not that prevalent in Oklahoma right now. It's more of a preventative measure. Is what and that's they're looking fine. At. That's fair. But like, okay, what state or what case study were you looking at to be like, oh, it's really bad there? Arkansas, Wisconsin. Those are the one Missouri, Northern Missouri. And those states can prove that they have mass die-offs of that's that's it's prevalency rates. That's the only who cares thing that about can go prevalency off rates though. I mean that's great. Well, it's, it's I, we got Lyme disease. Everybody has Lyme disease. Is yeah. it killing us? Not yet. Not yet. Maybe in fifty years, but we'll be dead by then anyway. Yeah, we've been sucking down Roundup for yeah years. I think that's that's where it goes back to the assumption that if a deer gets it right, it's eighteen months. So if the prevalency rate is high and those deer are getting it between yeah one, i mean yeah one I'm and with three you. years old a lot of assumptions there though it's it's in the science there, there's peer-reviewed data out there that says that this this goes back to like what do you do do you do nothing if you do nothing, some people say sure so again another point that would worry me as who we are as hunters if you do nothing you're gonna hunt a deer eventually that's three years old at the best mm-hmm if you do nothing before then though there should be some evidence that it's killing older age class bucks which i'm with you may be out there and i assume it's happening we're right not now. reviewing reviewing the yeah papers, i assume but. it's happening and uh, you know neurologically i don't know are they getting hit by cars more frequently are they getting shot by hunters more frequently because they're basically right. you know it's messing with their brain i don't right. know right we don't We've spent millions of dollars, though. Yeah, but the data has been collected. I mean, the farm, the farm research is going to be the same. So, like, remove those variables and just yeah. Get the farm research isn't though because they're in that that you know they have better nutrition. They're controlling the elements. Everything that they're doing there is trying to just say if I give this deer CWD, how long does he last? Essentially, why does it have to be that way? I mean, why can't they just uh, put them in a fence, like fence, and get wild deer mm -hmm. and put them in there? Mm -hmm. And shoot them up with CWD and see what happens. Yeah, I don't know. I assume they're going to die. Nobody, nobody wants CWD. Nobody wants to like. Yeah, but we want to know area. how deadly it is. I agree. Yeah, I mean, that'd I, be the way to do it, right? I mean, somebody, Put a fence up somebody around 50 had to acres. have done the research out there that says, okay, this deer we know was born this year. It's one and a half years old. It got CWD. It died here. What caused its death? Mm -hmm. I would say overwhelmingly it's probably deer vehicle or hunter yeah remove those two elements easy i don't it, you would have easy. to put it in that, put that research facility yeah but then the problem Take a is wild deer that, put it in 200 that, acre fence that research facility don't then it. becomes don't dog, drive cars dog shit because it's in the environment then so like 
for the foreseeable future, you can't do any Fine. other research. Though. Area 51. That's a lot of money in research. I don't, I no, don't know where it's, it's not. I bet it is. Why? To have that facility and to run those tests and diagnostics. Dude, it's stupid important. That's why he said he can't. He hasn't done the EHD one. I, I remember this was 20 years stupid ago. Stupid expensive, you mean? When we were testing for uh, EHD on deer, we would send like a spleen sample off. Mm. I think each one of those samples was like 500 bucks to get it tested to just tell me if it was positive or not. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of money. Yeah. I mean, it's a, yeah, but where's, it's the, a, where's it, the money coming? It's from? important. Where's I mean, it, it should be from? coming from, it, it should be coming from, uh, uh, from sharpshooting endeavors. There's not that many happening or from corn pile sales. No, I mean, the problem with the state agencies is they're not funded well enough to, to pay for this stuff. So it has to come from federal grants, right? Which, I mean, that's where the lobbying side is really coming into play is where's this federal money and I don't think I don't think the far there you go there's your money the far deer farming wants those tests to happen because it they stand to make a monster profit if this becomes a thing sure right I think the conservationist side also maybe doesn't want to do that because if they find these deer are you know I don't know living for 36 months then it's like well shit I mean how many deer make it to four and a half years old anyways. Yeah. Right. Well, I guess the conservation's got to make some progress then, because like right now I'm seeing a shift of like, well, if you guys can't figure it we're, out, the deer farmers yeah. will. We're at an unrest at this point because it's becoming. We're hearing it's more prevalent, right? It's just it's building. It's not nothing's getting better. Then it's like, well, what the hell is anybody doing to innovate? Mm-hmm. What's anybody doing to to try to beat this thing? Yeah. If the solution is, well, we just have to shoot the population down, and you know, it's just going to be a young deer herd. You're going to have to. That's not. Yeah, not acceptable. We're not taking that. Yeah. What's the other options? Right. Is it restocking? Okay. That's an extreme option. But like, if your only solution is shoot them till they're one, like <laughs> that's yeah. not an option. I mean, whatever. I, I can get over the purist thing. Like I'm not, you know, you know, if I had to pass on them does with purple ear tags in there, like, you know, fine. So be it. If that's what it takes for us to have a mature age class of yeah. bucks. I, I think the I other thing it. is, um, and I kind of got an answer, and and it, you just don't know is the landscape effect. Um, like how many deer released does it really take for this to like change the herd dynamic? Yeah, he gave a not an exact answer, but he just felt, well, it's because he, he just felt like as as long as you didn't harvest those deer, they were marked. He's the like, research hasn't been done, so like, nobody yeah. can really answer it. But I mean, you know, I have to expect it's going to take a long time because, like he said, even if they're pregnant does that then breed fawns those fawns will then breed with wild herds well that hybrid deer is not going to be up to par yet right right it's going to take so i mean you're talking mega generations here like 50 years maybe i don't know so like in our lifetime we may not see it i don't know i can't speculate so that's that's the other thing where it's like you know uh, and i mean okay like what's it gonna hurt but it's not gonna help necessarily for a while I don't know. Hmm. That's a pretty interesting conversation. I mean, I, yeah, we, uh, I think we know more than we did at, sure. the, be- at the beginning. So at, at least the basis for his research and, and the science that's out there, um, I'm sure in some point in the future, we're going to talk to somebody who, who will probably dispute the science for what it is. Yeah. Um, and that'll be interesting. I thought very relevant but, to hear um, kind of the scrapey side and the mad cow disease side in that, yeah. you know, not the same. I mean, scrapey's seeming very similar uh, and it seems like that's fairly under control now. Mm-hmm. So how'd that happen? And money would seem like we could do it with deer. Money, right? Yeah. They figured out mad cow. They figured out scrapies. It's just like, yeah, is there enough money to figure out the deer thing? And- you would think so. Yeah, you'd think so. So, yeah, I mean, interesting. I'm sure we'll hear, we're going to hear Nick's going to start a GoFundMe, so. Yeah, we're going to hear the other side (laughs) of it for sure. Um, But yeah, it'd be cool to continue to see. I mean, if all of a sudden something comes through with these deer having resistance to EHD, like the Texas deer do, then yeah, I mean, you're going to start and get some big pushes because that is the acute form, right? It's lower hanging fruit, yeah. That's the one where, you know, Deer reproduction can't keep up with that. Not yeah. saying that that's ever going to wipe out all the deer. It's just going to be in batches, but like it, it's happening more and more. Yeah, it's an immediate threat. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, yeah, cool stuff to to hear and, and localized, which is yeah, probably desirable as far as the disease characteristic. Yeah, I mean, you would you would not want that on a statewide basis. Uh-uh. I mean, that would be devastating. Uh-huh. 
Yeah. So localized. Yeah. Your farm could have it. Mine might not. You so don't, don't you ever say that <laughs> don't again. You ever say or was that Indiana we saw today? Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. Makes me nervous for Southern Ohio. I don't have any water anyway, so I don't know where they die. <laughs> they just would yeah. die somewhere. Yeah. Um, Hopefully my, my new water hole doesn't become a... Uh, <laughs> just a cesspool. Cesspool, yeah. Oh, yeah. fortunately, I, there shouldn't be any mud there. I got It's all... Uh, it's going to be clover, hopefully. Yeah, clover on the upper half. And I had them douse it. He put five acres on that. It's like it's like a sixteenth of an acre. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't think you can go too heavy on the clover. So we doused it and the bottom was uh bent night. So hopefully hopefully should hold That'd be good. rain on Friday. Cool. Well, we appreciate uh Dr. Chris Seabury from Texas A and M joining us and talking C W D and the the genetic side of it and uh really cool stuff there to just continue to to build on and um awesome to say that you know, as some of this new research comes out that he might come back and yeah, just cool conversation, you know, take it for what it is and make your own assumptions from it. And, uh, we'll catch y'all next week. Later. It's take me. Oh.